2022. We have a quorum. Thank you for everybody for being here. Number one, um, I know that Council Member Thomas wanted to be added to the, <clears throat> the substation ordinances. So those would be numbers four, five, uh, um, four and five. So we'll have those um, added to this and make sure that um, he, he is added to both of those item numbers. It's three ordinances actually all total because item number five is, is the appropriation and the expenditure. Uh, colleagues, here's my question for you. Um, just learned that the CAO is sick today. Of course, we, we understand that. I know we have questions about the presentations. My, my real question is we have a number of council led motion of uh, rather ordinances that being four, five, six, uh, and seven. But then there are a number of other ones where you may not have been briefed. So um, your staffs may have received a briefing, but you may not have been. So I just want to get, you know, the body's pleasure about whether or not you want to move forward with those this morning or wait. Um, cause I think it can save you'll be time reading the agenda if we decide to defer those matters, but I, I kind of want everybody to weigh in on that. So, um, I, I see council member green, you're on, what is your pleasure? During this 10 minute time period, or do we have enough time that I could review? No, I haven't reviewed the additional information. Would that be enough time? You think? Absolutely. Um, you know, and, yeah. and, um, and Mr. Shy needs to read them, read the agenda anyway. So right. you'll have that time period. Council Member Thomas, would you like to approach it in the same way? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, we have a uh, press conference and a uh, meeting with uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor and state officials uh, in my district uh, in about a, a half hour, 35 minutes. So I'm going to have to break for that and then come back if you don't mind. Uh, that's fine. We'll Thank we'll try and do this as quickly as we can. Um, Council Member Moreno and the other matters. Do you you want to wait the ten minutes? All right. She must have stepped away. All right. Well, why don't we do this, um, Mr. Shy? Um, will you read? Uh, why don't we do a roll call? I'm here. Council Member Thomas is present. Council Member Green is present. Council Member Moreno is present. We can facilitate that. For everybody watching, uh, remember, since we're in, still in a virtual world, what we are going to do is have Mr. Shai read the agenda in its entirety. We will take a 10 minute break. We will stick to that 10 minute break. And then we will, we will move to the items as quickly as possible. Council Member Thomas, because of your needing to leave, what I might do is, is put a plug on the presentations and see if we can get to the um, ordinances that we all know that we want to vote on first and make sure everybody can be heard on that and see if we can, if we can accommodate you, then I certainly understand you need to help your district and, and be where you need to be. So with that, Mr. Shy, I'll be quiet now and uh, thank you for reading the agenda and we'll take the 10 minute break after you're, after you're done. This is the agenda of the budget audit board of review committee meeting for Thursday, February 10th, 2022 at 10 a.m. Item number one. Roll call. Item number two, approval of minutes, January 25th, 2022, budget audit board of review commi committee meeting. Item number three, budget reports, CAO slash finance. Item A, personnel spending forecast. Item B, revenue collections report. Item C, operating expenses, available balances by department. Item D, reports on citywide FTEs. Item I, field versus vacant FTEs. II, budget field versus vacant FTEs. Item number four, ordinance calendar number 33617, introduced February 3rd, 2022 by council members Jeruso, Moreno, Morell, Harris, King, and Green an ordinance to establish the City Council Sewage and Water Board of New Orleans Substation Support Fund as Division 48 of Article 3 in Section 70 
of the Code of the City of New Orleans to ordain Section 70-415.307 through 70-415.311 of the Code of the City of New Orleans within said division and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. The description, this establishes a City Council Sewage and Water Board of New Orleans substation support fund. Agenda item number five, ordinance calendar numbers 33618 and 33619 introduced February 3rd, 2022 by council members Jeruso, Moreno, Morrell, Harris, King, and Green. These ordinances amend ordinance num numbers 28,862 MCS and 28,863 MCS as amended entitled an ordinance providing operating budget of revenues and expenditures for the city of new orleans for the year 2022 to appropriate american rescue plan act arpa funds provided to the city of new orleans orleans parish for the funding of a cea between the city of new orleans and sewage and water board of new orleans swbno for the building and development of a new substation to provide power from energy for swbno use and otherwise to provide with respect there to the description. This transfers $30 million from intergovernmental transfers to the City Council, Sewage and Water Board of New Orleans Substation Support Fund, Utility, Regulatory and Energy and Other Operating to fund a CEA between the City of New Orleans and Sewage and Water Board of New Orleans for the building and development of a new substation to provide power from energy for Sewage and Water Board of New Orleans usage. Item six. Ordinance calendar number 33,616, introduced February 3rd, 2022, by council members Jeruso, Moreno, Harris, King, Thomas, Green, and Morell. An ordinance to amend and ordain section 154-705 and section 154-781 of the Code of the City of New Orleans to exempt vehicles involved in certain criminal offenses from fines and fees imposed by chapter 154 divisions two and three, and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. Description, waiving all fines and fees in circumstances where the immobilization, towing, or impoundment of a vehicle occurred as a result of certain criminal offenses. Agenda item seven, ordinance calendar number 33,622, introduced February 3rd, 2022, by Council Member Moreno an ordinance to establish the Victims' Bill of Rights Fund as Division 48 of Article 3 in Section 70 of the Code of the City of New Orleans to ordain Section 70-415-312 through 70-415-316 of the Code of the City of New Orleans within said division and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. This description creates a special fund to establish a Victims' Bill of Rights Fund to reimburse victims of crime who were charged to retrieve stolen property and shall only be allocated or expended in strict compliance with subsequent council approval and to only be used for the purpose set forth in section 70-415-313A. Um, agenda item number eight, ordinance calendar numbers 33,623 and 33,624 introduced February 3rd, 2022 by Council Member Moreno. These ordinances amend ordinance numbers 28,862 MCS and 28,863 MCS as amended, entitled an ordinance providing an operating budget of revenues and expenditures for the city of New Orleans for the year 2022 to appropriate funds to the, to the to New Orleans City Council to fund an initiative, to fund an initiative aimed at returning funds to victims of crime who are charged to retrieve stolen property and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. Description, transfers $150,000 from intergovernmental transfers, miscellaneous programs to the Victims Bill of Rights Fund, fund balance slash CAO and other operating to, to, fund in a, in, to fund an initiative aimed at returning funds to victims of crime who are charged to retrieve stolen property, who are charged to retrieve stolen property. Item number nine, ordinance calendar number 33,579, introduced December 16th, 2021, by Council Member Moreno by request. An ordinance to amend and reordain ordinance number 28,549, MCS, entitled an ordinance providing a capital budget 
for the year 2021 in accordance with the provisions of sections 3-117 and 4-2061F of the Home Rule Charter of the City of New Orleans and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. Description, rollover capital ordinance to roll over the 2021 capital budget, except for the appropriation listings, which includes FEMA, federal aid, miscellaneous capital funds, insurance and bonds. The appropriation total, $3 million, $3,651,452. Agenda item 10, M-22-88, amendments to the classified pay plan adopted by the Civil Service Commission on January 24th, 2022. Item A, police department, crime laboratory hiring rates and NCIC unit new special rate of pay. Agenda item number 11, Motion M-22-89, amendment to the classified pay plan adopted by the Civil Service Commission on January 24, 2022. Item A, Council Utilities Regulatory Office, Curo Legislative Aid, new exempt classification. Agenda item 12, motion M-22-90, amendments to the classified pay plan adopted by the Civil Service Commission on January 24, 2022. Item A, additional pay plan amendments, hiring rates, pay, pay grade changes, and new citywide minimum wage of $15 per hour as per council motion M21-381. Agenda item 13, motion M22-91, amendment to the classified pay plan adopted by the Civil Service Commission on January 24th, 2022. Item A, sewage and water board, new special rate of pay, employees assigned inspectional duties relating to construction of public infrastructure and facilities who are certified as a public infrastructure inspector, CPII, via the American Public Works Association, APWA. Agenda item 14. Motion authorizing the selection of audit firms to perform the 2021 financial audits. Agenda item 15, adjourn. That completes the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Shai, for reading all the items on the agenda. It is now 10.13. We will take a 10-minute break and be back at 10.23 on the dot. Thank you all very much. All participants are now in listen-only mode.
Members, we have a minute till we come back, one minute. All right, Mr. Shai, that's 10 minutes. I'm gonna call the meeting back to order. Will you please establish a quorum? Roll we'll call, Councilmember Jeruso. Here. Councilmember Moreno. Present. Councilmember Morrell. You're on mute, but he's here. Councilmember Green. Here. Councilmember Thomas. All right, Mr. Shai, we have a quorum. It looks like we have potentially five. Councilmember Thomas is still logged into the meeting. I know members that ordinarily I said I want to start with the presentations, but because Councilmember Thomas is on the shot clock, if it's all right with you. What I'd like to do is go to our items first, four, five. Um, six, seven, and eight, which are the items filed by the council, come back to the reports, and then we can decide whether we wanna take up the remaining items. So with that, Paul, will you please pull up the PowerPoint presentation I prepared on the sewage and water board substation? Thank you. Will you go to the first substantive slide? Thank you. So members, I circulated this to you yesterday, and I think for the public, this comes as no priority for many of us, and particularly for Council Member Moreno and myself, who've been talking about this for the past several years, that one of the top priorities in the city of New Orleans is, is public safety. And as we talk about public safety, of course, we've been talking about crime, the importance of working on crime and how much we've been addressing it. But we also have to remember that public safety is other things. It's also safety and permits, it's code enforcement. And of course, it is our streets, it is our sewer, it is our drinking water, and it is our drainage. And for that reason, we have seen what happens when for decades we have neglected our critical infrastructure. We've seen repeated flooding across the city of New Orleans, not in one place, but everywhere. We've seen what happens with regular flood events. Take Ida out of the picture, but what, we, what we've happened in other times about how we've been flooded as a result of not having a reliable power source and the necessity to make sure that we always have power for pumps and clean drinking water and how important it is to have something that is cleaner, more resilient, and of course, more reliable. And one of the things I know this council has been focused on is how do we focus on our future? It's one thing to say that we have plans and priorities for right now, but we also want to make sure that we are executing to ensure that the city is as safe as possible, particularly when it comes to drainage and clean drinking water. Next slide, Paul. So this is a slide about the boil water advisories. Between 2018 and 2022, there were 30 boil water advisories issued for the city of New Orleans. In 2018, there were seven. In 2019, there were 11. In 2020, there were nine. In 2021, there were two. And so far this year, we've already had one. Everybody knows the importance of not only being able to have reliable, clean drinking waters in their homes, but also the way that it affects businesses too. 
Remember, people need to be able to shower, to brush their teeth, to fill up their water as necessary. But businesses also incur an additional expense for these unforeseen events. And making sure primarily residents, but also the people who live and work in the city, have clean, reliable drinking water is incredibly important. Paul, next slide. As I discussed at the beginning, we're gonna show a couple slides here of the flooding that we've happened in our area. And obviously the flooding of 2017 is what put a real target on the issue of power in the city of New Orleans. So for all of us who've been watching, you need at least 52 to 48 megawatts of power to run the system appropriately. And we learned in 2017, what happens when the power is not on to the extent that it ought to be. But it's not just 2017 where we've had these problems. Next slide, Paul. This is 2019. Um, and we've, we've had these flooding issues because of power outages in addition to the heavy rainfall. Nobody can deny that we are seeing more rain. We're seeing in some places heavier rain. We know the limitations of the system and how we need to address those. But if the power does not work first, then the pumps are never going to work. So you must, must have the power operational in order to have this happen. Next slide, please. And here are some more pictures, this time from the CBD of that flooding in 2019 as well. Next slide, Paul. I wanna spend just a second here about the steam power slides for a couple of different reasons. Number one is, for people who are in the weeds, you see that the slide is entitled 25 Hertz. Remember, there are two different power sources. There's the 25 Hertz power, there's the 60 Hertz power. And we now modernly rely on the 60 Hertz power to really run systems, except sewage and water board, which still has pumps that run on 25 Hertz power to ensure that the system is running properly. And to the importance, putting aside what type of system that we have is the age of this equipment. Look at these turbines, council members. Turbine one dates to 1909. Turbine three to 1929. Turbine four to 1915. Next slide, please, Paul. This is turbine five. And, and of the non-modern turbines, it's the baby of the group at 64 years old. You combine the age of all of these turbines, one, three, four, and five, it is 377 years old. I'm pausing because we are dealing with equipment that is nearly four centuries old. And as we talk about preparing for our future, making sure that we're living with greater resiliency, we cannot expect a city, a major important American city, to rely on infrastructure that combined is nearly 400 years old. Next slide. I, I put this one together because I think it's important for a couple of different reasons. Number one is when we've been talking about this substation, it is not something that just happened overnight, materialized out of thin air. It's been in conversation for roughly five to seven years now. And of course, the issue always has been, how are we gonna pay for it? How are we going to get there? And I wanna thank council member Moreno because one of the things she suggested was starting a working group that involved primarily sewage and water board, energy, the council offices, our utility advisors on how we could actually get a substation up and running. The second thing for me on this slide is look at all the meetings that we had regarding this, and particularly as we got towards the end with the administration becoming engaged on this matter. There are 25 separate meetings in essentially a year and a half period about how do we move the substation forward? How do we make this happen? And, and working through all sorts of issues from small ones to who's going to be responsible to technical ones to having lawyers involved. So it's important for everybody from my vantage point to see that this is not something that we dreamed up or happened overnight. It's something that this group has been working on for just a long time. 
Next slide, please, Paul. And of course, the importance of this is, is shown. Um, there are different press releases, both from Sewage and Water Board and from the council talking about the importance of this. And I'm just gonna spend a moment reading some of the things that were in there. The administration had to say that the substation will greatly reduce both costs and carbon emissions, improve environmental justice, and protect our ratepayers. The executive director, Gaston Corbon, said, we know that fully modernizing our power generation system is key to both the future of this agency and the city. That is why we are working tirelessly in coordination with our partners from Mayor Cantrell's administration, New Orleans City Council, and Energy to bring a dedicated substation to our Carrollton water plant. And last, Ramsey Green, Deputy CAO of Infrastructure said, this project is certainly one of the biggest infrastructure accomplishments of this administration and is vital to moving the Sewage and Water Board of New Orleans and our city forward. We cannot stress enough that time is of the essence when we're dealing with our critical infrastructure. Mr. Green, boy, I agree with you 100% about that. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, let's keep here um, for one second, Paul. Uh, and as I said, um, the council also worked on this by passing resolutions in the last term to discuss the importance of the substation. And I wanna thank council member Moreno who co-authored this resolution with me to show the support that we had. And she said over the past several years, this council and its utility regulation over Energy New Orleans has been laser focused on reliability, resiliency, vastly reducing environmental impact and real cost savings and this plan is a win on all counts. And I said what I always say, which is this is the most important infrastructure project in the city, but that this isn't a victory lap, but with the investment, we're getting out of the starting gate to plan for our future. All leadership is agreeing on the importance of why this substation is so important. Next slide. So remember colleagues, this was the original funding structure that was conceived and, and credit to the mayor working with New Orleans delegation, um, not only to make sure that state capital outlay funds were received of about $20 million, but also to the mayor for securing additional money for a turbine seven that will be online in 2023. Uh, we also approved just recently a capital budget of $20 million uh, to ensure frequency changes were added. And that's important to the slide I show about the turbines to convert the power from 65 to 25 Hertz. And then energy was supposed to participate at $34 million. So roughly the cost of this would be $74 million. Next slide. And, and a lot of questions we've gotten was how would Sewage and Water Board have funded this? So here's the answers. Sewage and Water Board would have incurred roughly a $6 million fixed infrastructure cost annually, but they would have saved between five and $7 million over a period of time in gas and electricity. And then that would have also reduced their repair costs because they're not spending so much money on turbine four blowing up or turbine five catching on fire or the age of all the other equipment, which they've inherited. And then of course the cost savings as well. Next slide. This is a little quick um, slide from energy that shows what the conversion does, particularly to the point um, that was being made earlier about resiliency that the substation will save almost 7.7 .7 million gallons of gasoline from being consumed each year. Next slide. So after the storm and before we could completely finalize the agreement, Energy said that they were no longer in a financial position to take care of the substation. And so we were left with a couple of choices. Choice number one was to wait and see if we got some funding somewhere else down the road. Choice two was to wait and see when Energy had the financial capacity to once again loan the money. And then choice number three is to use the ARP funds, which we have been calling for for six to seven months on critical infrastructure needs. 
I want to pause here for a second because I want to pull up, Paul, now the letters from Congressman Carter and from the state delegation because they talk about the importance of not only using this money for the citizens of New Orleans, but how we need to leverage these funds now and for our future. I'm going to start reading from Congressman Carter's letter, letter um, and, I'll, and I'll probably um, not read the whole thing, but I want you all to get a flavor of it because he does such an excellent job. And of course, we'll put the letter into its record and all of you have a copy of it. It's addressed to the entire council and says, as a U.S. representative for the second congressional district of Louisiana, I write to you in support of efforts to equitably utilize the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that I was proud to vote yay for in Congress and the American Rescue Plan. I strongly support your efforts to disperse the federal funding that they provide in a way that enhances the lives of all New Orleanians. And he talks about the importance of the projects where this can go and how particularly underserved communities have the fewest resources. And then he says, in addition to your efforts dispersing IIJA funds, I applaud the ordinances under consideration to use American Rescue Plan funding for a new, cleaner, and more reliable power source at Sewage and Water Board. Given our constant natural disaster threat and the reality of climate change directly impacting our community, utilizing this funding for great climate resiliency will enable us to better be prepared to address the climate crisis and create jobs that will directly strengthen our economy. And President Biden's building a better American fact sheet dated January 2022, cities are encouraged to spend their ARP funds on, in quotes, getting a jump start on water, sewer, and broadband projects that could complement investments from infrastructure law. The sewage and water board substation aligns with priorities that protect New Orleanians and that provide the catalyst for overdue updates and repairs to our sewer, water, and drainage system. I will fight continually in Congress for funding and resources that equitably benefit New Orleanians and all in Louisiana's second congressional district. And I hope that you will do everything you can on the local level to ensure these resources are utilized in a way that provides the greatest and most equitable impact on the communities we hold dear. I look forward to continuing our work together on leveraging city, state, and federal resources for the people of the city of New Orleans and the entire second district. And Paul, before you bring up the, the letter from the legislators, which is also important, I think, I think Congressman makes a very interesting point here that not only is this about a long-term plan to utilize resources on the city's most critical infrastructure need, it's also about creating jobs for people too. That's what we invest in infrastructure is we're investing in our people twice, once to give them infrastructure, but also to make sure that there's work to be done and how we work on that loop. Will you pull up, um, Paul, please, the next letter? And as Paul's doing that, I'll just start reading it. It's, it's shorter. This letter is from members in the public, members of the New Orleans delegation, particularly representatives Freeman, Willard and Hughes, and this is what they say. As members of the New Orleans delegation who sit on appropriating and capital expenditure committees in the legislature, we are writing in full support of the New Orleans City Council's plans to utilize federal infrastructure dollars to pay for a portion of a New Orleans substation at the Sewage and Water Board's Carrollton plant. We understand the importance and value of the substation and believe it is a top priority for the city. As you know, state capital outlay dollars are assigned to projects through HB2. Last year, we worked with the legislature's leadership to ensure that state capital outlay funds to integrate the substation with other equipment was given the highest priority. In fact, our efforts were a success and Sewage and Water Board was allocated the funding. Our colleagues in Baton Rouge know the federal government is sending over $350 million in American Rescue Plan dollars to New Orleans. We believe in order to secure future state capital outlay funds and to tap into infrastructure investment and job act money, the city of New Orleans must show its commitment to spending American Rescue Plan money on critical infrastructure projects like the substation. To that end, we fully support the New Orleans City Council ordinance calendar numbers 33617, 33618, and 33619 
to pay for the substation and to help our present and future abilities to secure infrastructure funds for the city of New Orleans. Lastly, we look forward to continued cooperation to leverage all available resources for the residents we all serve. And I think particularly having two former legislators here, they can attest to the importance of, of using state capital outlay dollars to help with bigger projects and to the commitment to show people in Baton Rouge how important it is that we are spending our money wisely. And Paul, can you, can you just go back again to the, the slide that shows the breakdown one more time? And then colleagues, I, I promise you, I'll be, I'll be wrapping up in a second. There we go. I, I want to I, I just put this up one more time because it shows really a thoughtful plan as all of the legislators are saying from the federal level, the state level, and the city level to leverage our resources. Some of the money comes from the city. Some of the money comes from the state. Some of the money comes from the federal government. This is a way that we can best use our resources to make sure we are pooling money to better protect the people of the city of New Orleans. And then Paul, will you also pull up the last attachment that I have that comes from the budget book, please? So members, I know this may be a little hard to see, but this comes from page 72 of the budget book, Paul. Thank you for making it bigger, particularly as my eyes are failing me. This talks generally about the ARP money, how it can be used, but I'm just going to hone in on um, the part where it says this. Current plans to use funds include, and then we scroll down, Paul, just a little bit, please. The last point has tap with a little leak on it and it says water sewer and broadband infrastructure make necessary investments to improve access to clean drinking water invest in wastewater and stormwater infrastructure and expand broadband access so this is an alignment of of what the budget for 2022 is supposed to look like from the budget book thank you paul and then can we just close out the last couple of slides Hey Joe, just to make clear, um, that was coming. That slide that you showed was coming from the from the mayor's budget book, right? Correct. That's exactly right, Council Member. Thank you. Um, I, I think I think the last pieces that I want to focus on here is remember that as a result of receiving the loan from Sewage and Water Board of thirty four million dollars, it was going to have interest, and and I have now a tabulation of showing how we got to the eighty five million dollars. But Sewage and Water Board is going to have to spend all that money over a 10 or 15 year period and repay loans. And now they will not have an annual repayment of $5.7 million. What Sewage and Water Board must do is be transparent about those cost savings. And we would expect them to tell the public, in addition to their IIJA plans, their master planning, how they plan on using that. From a personal perspective, I would like to see those savings dedicated to the SELA judgments that have been lingering for a long time that are due and owing, but also to advanced metering infrastructure, the smart meters, so we can finally get over the hump of, of bills um, not being sent correctly. And I think that should be the next highest priority for, for Sewage and Water Board and their capital infrastructure plans. Last slide, please, Paul. And then Council Member Moreno, oh, I, I, I have two slides. So what are the perceived obstacles to getting this done? I, 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 you know, I think there's really only one at this point. What is the ownership? But I don't know how hard of a problem that is. Energy would have owned originally, even if Sewage and Water Board paid it all off over time. So it, you know, it's not like a mortgage where you own the house and then you pay it off and then the bank owns 
um, the mortgage after the time you're done. It's, it's energy would have owned it. And that seems to be the case here too. But if anybody's concerned about that, and I don't want to speak for council president, I'm willing to convene the working group again and make sure all the lawyers are at the table and that we can get this buttoned up as quickly as possible to ensure that this is an issue for the citizens in New Orleans. I think my only other concern would be unnecessary delay. This has been negotiated, as Tim Light said, for a long period of time. That money is available. And the one thing that this council is working to avoid is any possible supply chain issues. We are putting this money up as a marker for our commitment to move forward. All right, now the last slide. This is Council Member Moreno, and I think it aligns with what we heard from our colleagues in Congress and in the state legislature about your IIJA Joint Council and Legislative Committee, Council Member Moreno, because I think the substation is the beginning of this conversation, but it is not the end. And that as we look towards how do we finance things in the future by using state capital outlay, by using federal funding, by using uh, bond money, this is something that is incredibly important to all of us. And we're showing, I think, two things here. Number one, by funding the substation that we are, this city and this council's commitment to leveraging those resources and showing that to Baton Rouge and the Beltway. And then secondly, making sure that we have a framework for doing this in the future. So I thank you for that. So with all of that, I will now be quiet and I'm happy to turn over the floor to any of my colleagues who want to add anything to this discussion. I know what I think in fairness, what I really need to do is let council member Moreno go first. You've been living this the longest and then I will, I see hands up for Morel and Green will go in that order, gentlemen, if that's okay. Council member Moreno. Well, first, thank you, council member DeRusso for your diligence in this particular project. We've been working on this for quite some time. As you mentioned, I think we convened roughly 25 uh, meetings of the special task force to look at this project. And I mean, really, this at the end of the day is just common sense. You know, we have um, ARPA money that is now available to us to specifically utilize for infrastructure projects just like this one. So let's utilize this money for really what I would call um, at the end of the day, uh, a life and property saving type of investment. So as we look at this project too, and we compare it to the original deal that we had with Entergy, this is actually much more beneficial to the sewage and water board. And at the end of the day, the sewage and water board rate payers, because instead of the sewage and water board having to repay the cost of the substation, um, which is roughly $30 million, they would also have to repay uh, a, a profit margin for Entergy Louisiana, um, Entergy New Orleans, excuse me. So that, that, that profit piece is, is already taken away and that was roughly estimated to be around $7 million, correct me if I'm wrong, council member DeRusso. So um, at the end of the day, you're looking at an overall savings of the construction of the substation, if you're talking about building the substation plus the profit piece of roughly $37 million. That's huge. So to me, this is a, this is a no brainer. This is at the end of the day, uh, just, just common sense. And to the ownership issue that for some reason is now a, a, a problem, the, the, the ownership of this asset was always going to be Entergy New Orleans because that's the way that these types of agreements ordinarily work. So, you know, if, if you just took, take a look at it, like let's say, you know, the power lines or the transformers outside of your house, you as a rate payer pay Entergy to build those, but you don't own them, even though they're right outside of your house. It's the same type of similar agreement and hospitals, other large industries do these same types of agreements where they pay for this additional um, type of power infrastructure from um, power companies. And they come to an agreement and a specific payment plan. And at the end of the day, it's not the, the particular customer that owns the asset. It remains under the ownership of the power or utility company. So the ownership piece, I don't understand why it's become an issue because it was never, whether it was the original deal through Entergy or whether it's now this deal, the ownership 
issue has never changed. It's just whether we're going to pay for it on the front end or we're going to pay for it on the back end on the on the on the backs of the the sewage and water board uh, ratepayer. So that's the big difference. At the end of the day, this is one of the most common sense proposals that I've seen in a long time. And I'm, I'm really eager and excited to move it forward because the faster that we move this forward, the faster that we can uh, accomplish the, the, the very aggressive timeline that we had put in place. We're not gonna meet it 100%, but we can get as close to it as possible to get this additional protection um, that we desperately needed for quite some time. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you for your work on this for such a long time. Council Member Morrell and then Council Member Green. Thank you, Council, uh, Mr. Chairman. Which my, my mic on, my mic's on. Okay, just making sure I wasn't getting a reaction. All right, so a couple of things. The first is, I guess what I find very interesting is who's on record being against this right now, Mr. Chairman? Has anyone actually come out publicly against this proposal? I have seen no one opposed publicly to this proposal. Okay. Well, I think the first thing I would I would I would I would really encourage the public to pay attention to is what people say in public versus what they say in prop in private. It is obvious that this power plant, this substation, is absolutely necessary. It is number one priority publicly for everyone on this call, publicly for the congressman. And according to Mr. Green and his comments that he's made publicly before, the administration is allegedly in support of it as well. I'm sure we'll see how that plays out when this bill, when this ordinance goes in front of the full council. But I really want to harp back on the ARPA piece. I spent a tremendous time in the legislature dealing with the challenge of misguided executives using one term, one time money for reoccurring expenses. It is the reason why when Governor Edwards entered the mansion, we had a over a billion dollar deficit. Because if you're given one time money and use it for reoccurring expenses and your budget cannot sustain the things which you spend money on, eventually you deficit spend to the point where you're in the hole. I have not seen a better project eligible for an ARPA expenditure than the substation. It is a one-time cost that will have a long-term benefit. And it falls clearly within the types of things that can be funded. But more importantly, even when you look at the type of things that can be funded, such as refunding to governments lost revenue, at no point in there does it say in that replacing lost revenue that it should be should be considered a reoccurring gift because it is not. We barely got the funds we have now. We are seeing difficulty in Congress getting any additional money. And any idea that we will have future funding in trunks like this in the future to pay for our basic thing, our basic expenditures is completely insane. So to be more clear, because I don't think I'm being clear enough, I know both. Councilor Moreno and I served in the legislature during Jindal. And we came up with the term Jindal math, which is when you take money that's one time and you go, I'm going to give a pay raise for it. And then the next year, when there's no more money, you have to cut things that you thought were essential to sustain bad spending ideas. I want to be very clear in this budget meeting that I am 100% against Jindal math. And when it comes to these ARPA funds, not just on the substation, but on everything else, I consider ARPA funds one-time money not to be used for reoccurring expenses. And as we get other requests from this administration or other ideas that come through this budget committee, if it includes ARPA funds for a reoccurring expense, whether it be new positions or pay raises, I will vehemently oppose it because I will not leave the city in a position when a year or two from now, the same people who so eagerly misspent money are now cutting essential programs and processes the people the city of New Orleans rely upon. We can't get the trash picked up. So I think this is a great example of how Auburn money should be spent. 
there is no one publicly opposed to it. And if someone were publicly opposed, Mr. Chairman, this would be the appropriate venue to come and publicly oppose it. Right, Mr. Chairman? Yes, uh, Mr. Vice President, I was going to let uh, Mr. Green go and see if they say at weddings, speak now or forever hold your peace. So, thank um, you. yes, thank you. For, thank you for the points. And I appreciate your perspective as a legislator on this as well. Council Member Green. Council Member Jeruso, I just want to thank you for that um, presentation today. Um, and I'm so glad that it's being shared with members of the public. Um, it was clear that this project is an extremely important one for our city. I want to thank you and Council Councilman Moreno, Council Member Moreno, for the work that you've done as the grass shows over the last couple of years, the many meetings, the 25 plus meetings, the work with our legislative delegation, the work with our federal official, our congressman. Um, it was great to see those letters of support for this project. Um, one thing that stuck out for me in a great way um, during your presentation was the executive director of the Sewage and Water Board saying that this project could result in a savings of five to seven million dollars, uh, money that could be invested in other infrastructure needs of the Sewage and Water Board and maybe even in some ways passed on back to our consumers. I know that there are our customers, there are many needs in terms of infrastructure and um, needs internally, but it's a savings for um, the sewage and water board that could be passed on to our um, our citizens. And also it's a good project in terms of using the resources that are available to us to get it done now. And I know that based on those meetings that you've had and in those meetings, there's probably been discussion of um, cities um, operating need and the like. Um, this project is going to be such an important, is such an important one that I know that those issues can be addressed in another way. But Councilman DeRusso, thank you very much for that presentation. To members of the public, um, I think that that presentation spoke volumes in terms of the necessity of this project. And again, I wanna thank you and Councilwoman Moreno for the work that you've done over the past couple of years and Councilman Morrell for your work in the legislature, working to get the capital outlay monies available um, along with Councilwoman Moreno to make this project happen. So. I'm just pleased to see this presentation today and to have reviewed all the information that you provided with me previously. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Green, and thank you uh, for those kind words and also for your support and, and your willingness to roll up your sleeves as well and, and jump right in with both feet. We appreciate that as well. Um, before I get to voting or public comment, is there anybody on this call right now who has anything to say other than myself, Council Member Moreno, Council Member Morrell, Council Member Green. Mr. White? Yes, uh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I just want to also say, do I, I appreciate um, your presentation and I agree, um, and the administration agrees with the importance of the substation. I think the mayor has been on the forefront of putting money and funding aside to expand and grow the infrastructure program. I think she's done a pretty good job of that. I think you've seen in all fronts, the bond program that we set aside for it and the like. And so we echo your sentiments. We also echo that what we can't do is use one-time money for reoccurring expenditures. We've been fighting to balance those things since we've been here. What we're hoping to do is continue to balance our current operating position through 2025 with the current ARP dollars so we right the ship, don't create a structural imbalance, and use the second tranche for this purpose. But other than that, we agree with the program. We agree with its importance. The mayor has always been pushing, as you read before. But we know we have three pots to deal with. And, and, and the mayor has always been committed to fulfilling the commitment of this program. She said it over and over. What we're attempting to do, again, is to balance the current budget and then use the existing um, ARPA money for those purposes. So reoccurring revenue match reoccurring expenditures. After that, the next tranche, if any infrastructure dollars that didn't come from the federal government or bond programs, 
then certainly any funding source will be able to be used for this purpose. That was our goal. She's always stated that, and we concur with the importance of the program, and we're ready to move forward with it. We want to make sure we protect every front, um, including the operating and the current operating expenditures. Mr. White, I'm going to go first to see my colleagues have their hands up. Sure. I, I'm, a, I'm a little confused, though, by what you're saying, because I feel like what I hear you saying is that the administration first wants to use ARP money for potentially lost revenue. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, what you're hearing is we've already done that. We've appropriated the $77 million initially. We appropriated the $85 million of the fund to hold in the current budget and the 22. So currently, the entire ARP dollars for the first tranche is already appropriated. That's why we're saying we're certain to concur with using the second, second tranche for this purpose. Right. I, I, I guess my point, though, is there is a second tranche that's coming. And the administration has also said that they want to spend potentially ARP money on something that's not a recurring expense, like the ARP plan for crime, right? Yes. So one time, sound, one time expenditures. I understand that. So we're in the, so we're in exactly the same place. We're going to have a one time expenditure on the most important infrastructure project in the city of New Orleans, which we will use ARP funds for. Right, right. I want to make sure I'm clear. I'm not suggesting we don't use ARP funding for it. The point is not the existing ARP first tranche because we secured the operating budget up to the level of we know what these expenditures are and not above it. So we concur with using it if that's the appropriate measure. We're just sec we're just simply saying use a second tranche. Well, I think we're going to have to look at all the appropriations before we get there. Um, and part of the reason we have substation and what's going on. I think that's probably what my colleagues want to ask about. So I'm going to go in order of, of um, hands up, which I think Council Member Moreno first and then Morrell. Actually, Council Member Morrell was first, so you can go ahead. All right, Council Member Morrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, couple of points. Uh, it's my understanding, it's a follow up. I'll follow up on uh, the Chairman's question first. You just stated that the administration's intent is to use ARPA money for the $18 million crime plan. Is that correct? That is the current plan, yes. Yes. The first off, just to be clear to the public, the council hasn't seen the actual details of the $18 million crime plan. So I, when I speak to it, I'm speaking towards what I read in the paper. A large component of that is pay increases for police officers. Is that not correct? That is correct. That is by definition a recurring expense. Well, let me finish my point. Um, not if it's a one-time bonus to encourage people to come and join the police force. So it doesn't necessarily um, mean that. What I would ask you to do is look forward to the presentation so you can see exactly what this is doing. It's not meant to, to bring in reoccurring expenditures. It's meant to come up with one-time uses. I do agree with you that if we do bring in reoccurring expenditures, we're creating a structural imbalance. That's not what we're attempting to do here. Okay, well, according to the report, because as I said, we didn't see the plan, we all read it in the paper. It talked about longevity bonuses, which would be eligible after officers hit certain benchmarks that would be in current years and future years. That is a reoccurring expense. We could come back to that conversation because I've already established where my position is gonna be. When we see the presentation, if there are reoccurring expenses in it, I'm telling you ahead of time, just to be just to be 100 and be candid, I will never support ARPA monies being used for a reoccurring expense, period, full stop. I mean, yeah. you, might have, you might have the votes around me, but it is setting up the budget for a structural imbalance. And I appreciate we're replacing revenue each year, but I want the public to understand you're talking about large chunks of money. What was the most recent? What was it? It was $70 million was the last pull down y'all had on this? 70, $80 million? It was 77. So if I can and, and answer your question, right. um, I look forward to once we present it, we can have that conversation so we can dive into the re reoccurring revenue with reoccurring expenses and one time. I, I, I encourage that conversation, but you're right. We used 77 in the first mid-year. 85 to balance this year's budget and then rolled into 22. So the entire amount, yes, they and are you, large sums. And you're, and you're gonna make available to us the breakdown of how you plug that 70 plus million dollar in the budget and how it was tagged specifically to non-reoccurring expenses. 
Yes, and so to be very clear, what we did is, is as you know, the first year we lost $100 million in, 20 million, in um, year 2020. So that 77 was used to plug that hole. Next year, the following year in 2021, we um, had additional, we had to cut the entire budget by 100 million because we didn't do it the first year because it, the pandemic just was thrusted and just happened to hit us immediately. So once we cut the budget and we began to receive the ARP money, we replaced some of those cuts with the 77 million I'm speaking to. The next year's budget, now that we received the opera money, we replaced all those money, even though we knew we had an $85 million shortfall. So we use 85 million to plug that uh, shortfall and knowing for, going forward, we project that we will have a shortfall in 2023 and 2024 and we'll be back balanced by 2025. And that's all we're simply saying. Well, and I appreciate that, but here's the challenge that I have as a person, a member of this committee and over the council budget process. We know from the White House directly that the large, over half the money that's in the plan that's going to be given out will be competitive grants. And those competitive grants, which are being withheld, and that's part of what former Mayor Landrieu is over now, that competitive branch structure will, will largely be based upon how the money you got was spent leading up to that competitive grant process. And when you look at projects like the energy substation and prioritizing that over other things, that will help us in the competitive grant process. It would seem to me that hoarding the money to plug holes in the budget over multiple years will actually have the opposite effect in the, cap in the competitive grant process. Because if we're, I'll tell you my experience as a legislator and my time dealing with uh, the federal government and multiple uh, congressmen, senators uh, working on the Hill, the people that don't get competitive grant money are the people that are still sitting on money. Other cities across the nation are spending this money as quickly as they can get it on the different, different objects and items it is eligible for to demonstrate need to the federal government for additional money. If our plan, our plan, if the mayor's plan and the CAO's plan is to sit on the existing money and just patch holes in the budget and not to present progressive, aggressive plans like changing the face of our infrastructure in the city, not only will we not get new money, we'll be at the back of the line behind everybody else. So I look forward to having that public dialogue about what that $18 million looks like. I'm going to reiterate, just because I need, I feel always need to do so, that from what I read, and the, the, the comments by the mayor were voluminous about what she plans to do with that money, the vast majority of it is a reoccurring expense. And I will tell you that it is very difficult to cut. I, I lived through the Jindal years of cut, cut, cut your way to excellence. But the reality is, is that if we're going to have carry forward expenses, that's exactly what we're going to have to do. And I'm sure you probably didn't watch our very, very, very lengthy second crime meeting. But in one meeting, we found that JJIC was budgeted for 100 positions for 2022 when they knew they couldn't fill the existing positions they had. And they now have 50 people on the payroll. We budgeted them for over 100, and they could not provide any any confidence that they'd fill those positions. So I will tell you in most budgeting practices, when you have significant unfilled positions, that becomes one of the areas you have to look to to fund other parts of the budget. So I look forward to having this dialogue. I look forward to us agreeing that we're not gonna use any reoccurring expenses for it with ARP, we're not gonna cover reoccurring expenses with ARP dollars. And, I think we're both in agreement on that. I look forward to seeing the mayor's plan presented publicly to the council. Thank you. Um, if, if possible, can I respond to a couple of things you said um, before sure. we move on? So if we go back, if once the pandemic occurred and we talked about a $120 million hit to the city's revenue, the initial hit, the initial program was the CARES Act, as you recall. And that money went through the state and before that money hit the city, it was transferred and redistributed to other places. So we never got the full breadth 
of how that money could have helped the city. The reason why the big fight for the ARPA fund, for the different pieces that it was allocated for, the reason why revenue loss was included in there because the cities like us were not able to receive it and they knew we had a big revenue loss. So immediately we would have to cut a great deal of operating expenses um, if we were going forward. So the ARPA money was used for that purpose, revenue loss. It wasn't to add additional expenses, it was to cover the current expenses and replace the revenue loss. All we're simply saying, we know, we know that that revenue loss was not going to occur in just one year. The recovery period would take longer. We're looking to use the first tranche to make sure that we're covering our existing operating revenue through 2025. If at some point the projections are wrong and the economy grows tremendously and that revenue is there, then we can use that money. I just don't understand if we use the money now, the first tranche, then what we do is make the operating ability risky because we have no other revenue to replace it with. Because the bonds can't replace the operating, IJA money can't replace the operating, and also any capital outlay can. We only have one bucket to replace this revenue loss category. And we're simply saying, cover the normal reoccurring revenue and I mean, reoccurring expenditures until the reoccurring revenue matches that. That's simply it. That's why we're asking to use a second tranche. I understood that the first time. And I think we have a disagreement. Uh, we have a disagreement because I understand using monies to replace lost revenue, especially for 2020, especially for 2021. But a couple of things. One, like I said, if you're still sitting on opera money in 2025, you're not getting any competitive grants, period, full stop. I, I don't think be, we will be. Okay. Well, as, as, a, so, as, a, as in the revenue loss category, you're right. I think any major project with this continuum, you have to give it time to go. So if you were front, so we set that aside, I agree with you. Okay. Two, the state of Louisiana has not allocated the amount of money necessary to fully fund doing the sewage and water board project. But what I will tell you is very troubling to me is that last session, last year, there was a $300 million set aside of federal funds for water treatment facilities and plants. Sewage and water board didn't even apply. Did not even apply. Every water system in the entire state applied to get access to $300 million in federal money, sewage and water board didn't even apply. And this is a real significant problem as far as how you interact with legislative and federal partners in that sewage and water board didn't apply for money like the rest of the water programs and is consistently surprised when capital outlay doesn't show up in the level it should. And I will tell you, just candidly talking to legislators, there's going to be another $500 million trunk add to that program. It will be very difficult, if not impossible, for the Sewage and Water Board to get more additional state money without using the existing processes to it to access water money like every other water system in the, in the state. But to the larger level of dysfunction, and like I said, we are going to agree or disagree, this entire ARPA plan is conceived in a way to reward cities that are not looking beyond what is today, but what their plans are for the future. And it would seem to me that based upon your testimony here today, we have the least imaginative and most conservative position one could possibly have. And while other cities are going to reap tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars in additional funding, we are content to rather than adjust the budget, and I'll be very candid, when you tell me these years and how long we plan on funding it out, we're in 2022. We are creating, if we don't cut the budget significantly to adjust to the fact that I am, I am not under... I am under no illusion that under the current current trajectory of the city, we're ever going to reach the revenue we had in 2020 anytime soon. And I'm very concerned that with balancing the budget with ARPA money, which is spending money on reoccurring expenses, you're creating a cliff after 2025 for the next administration and the next council. 
it would be far easier, and that's gentle math, to just do that, to say, you know what, let's just keep using what we can do to get through our term, and the next term someone else will have to deal with it. I've seen the results of that, and I don't agree with that. So I think I think fundamentally, I think we disagree on this point. Like, I, I hear what you're saying, but when you're telling with me we're going to use ARPA money to fill budget holes, and like I said, I look forward to getting a budget document that separates the reoccurring from not reoccurring. I could be completely wrong. I will concede that. But when the terminology is we're replacing lost revenue, it really, and it's being interpreted as revenue that we're replacing lost revenue with ARPA funds, it really is, seems to me like that's reoccurring revenue that ARPA funding is being considered as a replacement to reoccurring revenue. And I fundamentally disagree with that. So well, help me understand. We, we, we can keep you talking to each other. No, no, I, think, I, I, I think understand we just have a disagreement. There. No, I do. I, so, and, and so, what I'm getting at is that the entire federal revenue loss category was for the purpose of replacing that revenue. I think where you seemingly um, think that I disagree with you is that we continue that on beyond some eternity and leave. Um, and this administration leave the next administration with a structural deficit. That's not what we're we're doing. Okay. What we're simply saying, what we're simply saying is, we know what the revenue was in 2019. We know what the projections were in 2020, and then on. We're simply trying to balance that back up. Beyond that, you're right. We have to deal with the existing revenues and manage our expenses accordingly. That's all we're simply saying. But we also knew that our revenue and our economy is not going to grow back day one. Pandemic over, we start having events, it's not going to go back day one. I think we can agree with that. It's going to take time. That was the purpose of the revenue loss category. But once we get to whatever that account, that number is, then we have to live within that, that, that um, revenue category and our expenditures have to align with it. We're not saying carry it beyond that. So I don't think we disagree um, as much as you believe. In my opinion, what we're simply saying is, let's just sure up what we know is the case in the first tranche and then move forward with the second tranche to, to move these capital programs and infrastructure programs like the mayor has suggested and move. That's all we're saying. I think we're both understanding each other and I think we're both disagreeing okay. on terminology. Okay. And I think that sometimes like we could have, and I think we have a very honest disagreement which is fine. I mean, I think, I think that we can both hold our positions. We both explained our positions. We're both not willing to concede our positions. That's kind of where you have an impasse. So like I said, when we go through the budget process, I know uh, council member Jeruso, our chairman is going to start the budget process significantly sooner this year than previous years as we come through the budget and see what the revenues are and aren't. But I think an area which I think this council is going to fundamentally disagree with the administration is there's this idea that we're, we will ever return to the trajectory we had in 2019, 2020. And I can tell you with the current state of things in the city and in this country, I don't think that that trajectory is ever going to happen again in the near future and that the budget should reflect what the new trajectory is and not simply be replacing revenue as to where we should be based upon previous projections versus where we are. So I guess I think it's an honest disagreement. We're not going to agree on this call. And that I look forward to working through the budget process to see how we how we put these different funds in a different trunks of city government funding and make sure that reoccurring expenses are not being paid for with offer funds. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll concede to someone else, Ben, if you want to speak. Thank you. I have a few follow-up questions before Council Member Moreno very quickly. Mr. White, I just want to make sure I understand a couple of things. First is um, you spoke about three different sort of buckets of the first tranche. Was the $85 million committed for 2021 budget? $777 was committed in 2021. All right. What about the, where is it? the remaining was committed in 2022? 85 for 2022? 85, the we mid-year 77 million right. and the remaining of the ARPA money was committed in 2022. But what about the 22 you spoke about earlier? Yeah, it's 85 plus the 22 was committed in fiscal year 2022. I, I got it. But I guess, I guess to that point, the significant portion of that money in fairness was for positions that were desired in 2020, but that haven't been filled yet. 
If you look at the FTE report right now, there's there's many, many positions that are unfilled where that money is still available. Right. And I think where you're going is the fact that it's overfunded. But as we've always said, the whole point that we were doing was pulling that money into the city's coffers to provide for the reserves that carry us to that 2025 um, year. That's what we're referring to. So that you, was you say, you, yeah, I get it. But at the same time, this is going to be you know the second time I need to make this point. The mayor's plan is to use ARP money on crime. That's not a lost revenue thing. That is a new plan. For, for, because it wasn't part of the budget last year, we would have heard about it in, in terms of budget. So I'm I'm correct, aren't I? That you're part of what, the second tranche. I want to make that I, I don't know what tranche. You're, I don't know what tranche you're referring. That's really where I'm headed. Is are right. you, is the administration wanting to take the money for its crime plan from the first tranche of money or from the second tranche of money? Well, the key, and and I think at that point, I think we're gearing up to do a presentation. As I said before, I think um, the councilman Morell said that he's waiting for the presentation and it's coming forward. What we had agreed to, I thought we all agreed to by appropriating the dollars at the first tranche to be set aside for revenue losses to make sure we protect the existing operating. Then all other things will move to the second tranche. That was the strategy. I, I get it, but I, I, in fairness, I don't think you're answering my question. So well, I'm gonna try it one more time. Is the mayor's crime plan based on using ARP money from the first tranche or the second tranche? The second tranche. Okay, thank you. Then, then, then we can talk later about, even though we thought about creating new positions, the propriety of doing that, knowing the crises that we're in at this moment. Thank you very much, Mr. White. I'm gonna turn over the floor to Council Member Murray. Thanks, uh, Council Member Drew. So just uh, a couple of follow-ups really, uh, Mr. White. So in the FTE report, there are roughly 968 vacancies right now, which is roughly 20% of our, our workforce. Um, what is the dollar amount for the total of FTE? What's the dollar amount for the F the vacancies? I think I didn't, somehow you cut out on your last word. Can you repeat yeah, the dollar amount for the FTE vacancies. I, I don't know that offhand I can get it to you, but there is a significant dollar amount if that's your point. I would think it's probably more than $30 million. It is significant, yes. Yeah, I, I and, think- And if I can add this to, to your point, um, when we cut the budget in 2020, and in order to balance it, we did suspend hiring. So we, did, we do know that they did allow for a lot of vacancies as people left and we didn't uh, reprogram those positions. So we're ramping back up. Um, however, I think you're speaking to what we call turnover savings. There's available dollars to do turnover savings. And that's, that's traditional in any budget in a year. It's, more, it's significant now because of what we're coming out of. Um, but what we're saying is any savings that's occurring through those means put, will be added to our coffers that help us get through 23, 23, 24, and 25. Absolutely. Which, and I think we're pretty much making the same point. I, um, I agree. I agree. Know, I think that with the number of vacancies that we have, um, you know, it's certainly uh, more than $30 million, which is roughly the cost of, of the, the substation um, here. So I think it, 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 if we use ARPA money and based on the number of hundreds of vac vacancies that we have, I actually don't think that it'll have, uh, it, it doesn't, just common sense doesn't look like it'll have this huge drastic impact on um, well, um, when you say drastic impact help me understand what you mean by that because the goal is that we knew we're 85 million dollars short this year the projection was 60 next year and then 40 and then 30 so we're using that money in the coffers that you're talking about 30 million to help deal with the next year's budget so i think what you're suggesting is the savings now within the budget is no longer needed so let's redirect it here it may not be needed this year but it will be needed for year 23 24 and 25 that's the purpose. We're not looking at using the additional ARPA money to plug those holes. We're simply looking at the, the first tranche that we plugged and also put in our coffers going forward, is what I'm saying. I think we're gonna agree to, once again, another, another point here that we're gonna agree to disagree to. Um, I think that, and, and I don't wanna get into the whole conversation of whether or not you, know, you all are using these dollars for reoccurring funds, but that has already been debated at length with council member Morrell. But what I do believe is that, um, you know, even though 
you're saying that the 85 million of the ARPA dollars were appropriated, they have not been expended yet. So therefore that money is, is certainly still available. And based on the fact that we have hundreds and hundreds of, of vacancies of funded positions that are not filled, I think it just makes all the sense in the world to be able to use the, the ARPA dollars and expend the ARPA dollars for this one-time infrastructure project um, because of the fact that we don't have all of these filled positions. We're really not, in my opinion, um, lose out. So that, that's just kind of my thoughts on this, but I'll turn it back over to the chairman, Mr. Chair. If I can respond to your last point, um, you're right. We're not suggesting don't use ARPA dollars. We're, say, we're just suggesting using the second tranche. You're right, we do have a surplus as a result of those vacancies. As right. I said before, that's why we're using that additional money as it moves into our coffer to, to balance our budget in 23, 24, and 25. If that money isn't available or any other opera money, then we don't have another source to cover those costs. We would have to drastically cut our operating budget. I'm not saying let's grow our operating budget. I'm simply let's maintain the operating budget, replace the revenue to be able to sustain it is what I'm referring to. If we take that money out now, then between now and some other source of funding, at that point, we don't have money to plug that hole. That's all I'm saying. So I'm not suggesting don't use ARPA money. I'm simply saying we, we agree to a strategy to protect the operating budget um, going forward. Let's use a second tranche for a much needed purpose as um, Councilman Jerusalem spoke to. Can you send me um, this afternoon or, or really as quickly as possible what the dollar amount is for those 968 vacancies so that we see you know, how many millions and millions of dollars that is? Sure. Thank you. I can do that. And, and you know, all these questions keep on begging one more thing before I get to council member Thomas, Mr. White, I mean, if we took the money right now, knowing that we're gonna have a second tranche in May, then can't we just use the second tranche if we come back to for those expenses? I mean, it's the, the timing is is no different. Um, the only thing is, is that it's not 100% assured that we're getting it. So that's why we roll with the revenue loss category first and then move to the other programs later because we knew if we didn't get the second tranche that there's other holes that we can use the, um, to plug that particular um program. We don't have another pro, um, operating bucket to go to to plug up the revenue loss category. I, I get it, but um, I don't think Congress has indicated unwillingness not to fund those money. So that's something we'll, we'll take into consideration. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Council Member Thomas. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you guys. I just got back from a very exciting press conference about an investment in uh, the Lower Ninth Ward in, uh, in District E. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. White, do we have thirty million dollars in unfilled positions? I don't know exactly it's thirty million, but we do have a significant amount of unfilled positions because we deferred hiring. So there's a significant number. I will get that to you today. Okay, could you let me know what that is? Sure. And I've been told that you guys use a uh, zero-based budgeting model. Uh, we build the budget based on a program. Yes, you, you build the budget based on that program, and not. We're implementing the program. It's not fully implemented, but that is what we're doing. Okay. So in, in a zero-based budgeting model, when you budget, you budget for your outcomes or for essential services, right? So when you have a budget, that budget is there, is based on what you need to do and fulfill in terms of that municipal got a budget, correct? Correct. So, so what you're saying is that if there's, if there's anything that affects that budget, it takes away from what was budgeted in terms of those services that were planned when that budget was passed. Correct. Oh, yes. So the prior council passed this budget. We appropriated the dollars in the budget, correct. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, restrictions, are there, uh, we talk about from one tranche to the next. Are there any restrictions that are unique from tranche one to tranche two based on Councilman Jerusalem's question? So what's, what's different? Uh, uh, is the first tranche, uh, you can spend it a certain way in the second tranche, you have to spend it another way or is it the same pot of money? It's the same pot of money just given in two different buckets, but the same program exists within both. 
the same okay the same program yes if you took the 30 million dollars out of the first tranche how long would it be before we had a chance to get to that money in the second tranche especially since this is something that the administration wants to do correct with or without energy you're you're referring to the substation yeah. funding yeah, yeah it, it would be, um, the projection is that they uh, um, have agreed to release the money in May. And how much, how long would that delay this, uh, this project? I don't know, I'll have to talk to Kassan, um, but I don't know the answer to that question. What would be at stake if we took the $30 million, uh, since some of what, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm reading this, these revenue projections and Kind of going back in my mind about how budgeting was done in in, in the past, uh, especially when you talk about essential services and stuff that you budget you for projections. What would be at stake if we use if we took the thirty million dollars and use it now? What we would do is, um, I believe, to your point, is that what we do, what we know, is the money we have in hand now, and that is the first tranche. The reason why we chose to use, to use revenue loss because we would have to protect the existing services of the city, police, fire, EMS, mm -hmm. and all the likes of uh, us. Mm -hmm. And by placing that revenue loss, we protect those services and we move to the second phase to fulfill the commitments of the capital program. Right now, we know the, and we're confident we'll get the money in, uh, in May for the second tranche, but it's not 100% assured. And, and if we I know, don't this, get that money, then you're, we're going to lose the services that we have available now to you. Okay, so services will be lost. Services will be lost. And I don't know. Going, this, from, going from 2023, yeah. 24, and 25. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the chairman of this committee is, is, is so good at what, what he does. Uh, I don't know that this question is maybe uh, in line with this committee, but I think I have to, have to ask you. And you guys considering whether you wanted to use tranche one or tranche Two, you know, is there any consideration in terms of uh, making sure that essential services are not affected versus bailing out energy and, and, and them reneging on their commitment? Um, I'm not sure. Council member, you were asking me that question. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, did, did any consideration go in and say, hey, hold on a second. We had a commitment from energy. For whatever reasons, they bailed out. Uh, why do we want to risk potential essential services moving forward just because they didn't do what they committed to? I mean, is any of the, does, does that thinking at all go into the discussion or planning or, uh, or the position of the administration? No, for the position administration has always been that we knew we have an operating, we have to operate a city. We also know we have a massive capital program that includes some of the infrastructure things we're discussing today. Whether well, energy reneged, reneged on their promise or not, it it was. I think I think Councilmember Jeruso um, spoke to that earlier. I think the answer to that is yes. And you don't know if there's thirty million dollars worth of unfilled positions, but you'll get me that information. I will. But but the important thing is, um, it may be unfilled, but that revenue will go down into a net income, if you will, retained earnings into our coffer that will help us pay for our holes in 23, 24, and 25. So How even much? though it's not used now, it's still used to protect the service going forward because we'll continue our revenue loss going Yeah, forward. I understand that. Uh, sure. it, it, you never can predict what will happen. Sure. Uh, how much is uh, uh, the surplus net? Right now, we're probably sitting on with this year, um, the previous um, financial statement about $10 million surplus that was that's unallocated to any um, program. That will grow, no doubt. It will grow um, substantially to cover those 23, 24, and 25 categories. Now, now when, you're, revenue, budget, mm -hmm. when sure. you're budgeting, uh, uh, and you guys are supposed to be the experts in that, when you look at surplus, what's your surplus for? Especially in the zero-based zero, zero based budgeting model that you guys use. Yes, um, good question. So what we're looking at is that there's no way that that the city, a city like ours, can use all of our revenue and then expect to get new revenues to fund new programs. We have to have a reserve for many things. For example, we have $31 million set aside for emergency response, particularly the hurricanes. 
to be honest with you, based on Ida uh, hurricane, we know that's not enough. Even though we may not assign a dollar value to it, sometimes we get relief from the federal government. And if, if a hurricane costs somewhere to the tune of 50, 90 million dollars, the federal government do pay for those. But the problem is that money comes later. It may come in months, it may come in years. Mm -hmm. So the existing reserves that we set aside, that cash will be used to fund us until that happens. The other thing would be is any other program, if we have capital programs, that would be helpful. But most important to me is when we set aside money is an indication that we have protection in, in the uh, event that something goes wrong. If, you, if, if we go back to when I think we went to the bond market and we went to the bond market, they were concerned about um, the impact of the financial conditions um, that caused by the uh, pandemic. We had to assure them that we were gonna use this opera dollars to plug up the holes going forward so they would give us a better rating. That better rating provided favorability to us that gave us additional money that we were able to use for uh, additional programs. If we now take those dollars and set it aside um, differently, we would have reneged on our word. They would consider the financial condition risky because what we're saying is the money you have now is not set aside for its purpose. We have to wait for additional dollars. They will consider that being risky. So what we do is that in any city, there is a certain amount of reserve set aside in the event that we have some things that we don't know about. Generally, it's somewhere between 10 to 20 percent. Two more thoughts. Uh, tranche one, tranche two. This, this is something that everybody wants to do, something that the administration, administration wants to do. Uh, it's obviously something that the council wants to do. Uh, uh, I don't know whether need to do. You know, I don't know. I'm learning a lot more now about how this process was and how it is uh, now. But tranche one or tranche two, if you have two tranches and, and, and there's 30 million, million available uh, in each tranche to do this, why not take it out of tranche one and then replace it with tranche two? Well, what, why are you recommending that we not do that? because if tranche two doesn't get here and for some reason something happened at the federal level, then we've exposed ourselves to operating cuts that we can absorb given the fact that we know we need to increase services in a lot of departments, we would lose that opportunity. So I'm simply saying, um, let's not risk that. We know what we have in front of us. We know we have an operating budget. When a tranche two get here, we can now fund the programs we're talking about and everything can go through perfectly, there's no risk to anything. A bird in the hand? Bird in the hand beats two in the bush. Now the gap in, in COVID uh, and Ida, the gap about $195, $200 million in terms of revenue? Um, repeat your question again. The, the gap in, in, in collections, the gap is about $195, $200 the, million? The, the gap in collections from the start was $100 million, $120 million we started. When okay. we moved to next year's budget, it was $100 million. And right now, to plug the hole in 2022's 22, budget, um, it was $85 million. All right. And it started, hey, hey. it started to decline as our revenue grows. Right. And so why is it important to project forward to uh, 23, 24, and 25? What, what do you know uh, about what's going to happen or won't happen then where we need to make sure that money is spread out to meet budget projections going into 23, 24, 25, why? Well, if we know we walked into the 2020, physical year 2022's budget and we're $85 million short, there mm -hmm. is no possible way we're gonna grow 85 million in revenue in one year. There's no possible way. Uh, and so what we do is we're looking at that there is a scale in which the revenue will return mm -hmm. and what will set aside revenue to be able to um, plug that hole going forward to 2025 and then if for some reason our expenses, and hopefully it maintains the same, our revenue becomes higher and there is a surplus there, then that money is available. But right now there's no protection from anywhere that revenue will grow that quickly. The National, League, yeah, the National League of Cities offers so many programs yes. on budgeting and how municipalities uh, budget. Uh, it's out there for everybody to, to, to review. Uh, when was the last time we had a municipality uh, close the $85 million gap? Are there any that we could go to in terms of precedent so that, we, so that this council could be, could be comfortable taking a look at that where you know municipality has made up that, that much of a gap? 
I don't know of any. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member Thomas. Um, I'm gonna bend the rules um, for, for comeback because this is such an important issue. So Council Member Morrell, then I have a follow-up question on something Council Member Thomas asked and Council Member Moreno. Um, and then I think we'll go to public comment and voting uh, unless anybody has additional comments they wanna make. Council Member Morrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of quick points, and this is kind of an address mostly to Councilman Thomas's points versus Mr. White. The reason why this resolution was filed, the main reason as a co-author of it is because of timing. This has been an issue. This substation has been issued, debated by this council, this administration and energy for over a year. As things stand right now, this substation will likely not be online for the beginning of the 2023 storm season. If we wait for a trunk two, then what you're looking at is maybe the 2024 storm season, maybe a 2025 storm season, because the reality is engineers who've looked at this plan and looked at supply chain issues have repeatedly cautioned us. That's not only an issue of when you get the money, it's when you begin construction, when you start seeking the parts and so on and so forth. If I appreciate the cautionary position of the administration, but I would counter if we have an August 5th flood event again, or a similar event that floods substantial parts of our city, we already have businesses and citizens who are so fatigued with constant flooding and substandard city infrastructure, they will pick up and go. And you know, it's even harder to climb yourself out of an 85 million or 95 million or even $45 million deficit when there are less people and less businesses currently staying in the city and future businesses and people do not move in because of our crumbling infrastructure. So the reason why this resolution is in the posture it's in is because we cannot afford to wait anymore. We've already lost, pretty much lost the 2023 storm season. So this storm season, next storm season, there's no substation. The entire system is compromised. The longer we wait to see if the money shows up, we're trailing even further out as far as when the substation will actually get built. So a lot of the members who are on this particular bill, and you've seen that a lot of co-authors on it, yeah. we're all on it because we don't have time to wait whether energy figures it out, whether sewage and water board figures it out. The ARPA money is literally for this purpose, which is to try and solve these problems now versus hoping they get solved later. And I can tell you, we got this sum of money because the entire country was affected by COVID. If we're just getting flooded again, then and there is a different president and a different Congress, there is no guarantee we'll get the kind of money needed to not only build this power station, which we won't have an effect, but to rehabilitate our citizens and businesses that get devastated by flood events because we waited. And I mean, oh, you've seen every year, Councilman Thomas, FEMA gets less and less generous each year, especially considering we are in a horrific floodplain map to begin with. Insurance rates go up, FEMA reimbursement goes down, and that's why there's a sense of urgency in doing it this way versus waiting for Trump 2, because Trump 2 will put us in a 20, 2024, 2025, as far as the substation coming online. So I just want to put that point out there. That was the rationale. Yeah, by no. doing it this way. No, and I'll be brief, Mr. Chairman, since the uh, uh, Vice Chairman addressed me. Uh, I, I appreciate that. That that helps me in terms of I'm, I'm looking through these documents. So, so it is is it is a decision between natural disaster versus budget disaster. It, it, I mean, do we do we look at it that way? Is is that the choice I have to make? Natural disaster versus budget disaster? Or I think it, it, I think I think it is far more likely that we will have a natural disaster, then we'll, when we won't get the second tranche of this money. The president we have will still be the president when we're looking at this next trunk of money. This next trunk of money will happen before hopefully Congress turns over, but it is almost assured, have you seen each year because of climate change and our location, we will have a climate disaster, whether it's a hurricane or whether it's just significant flooding events. And we have seen from all of our citizens across the city that it is very difficult 
especially to convince new residents and businesses to move here and residents capable of leaving the stay if we continue to flood. And not just flood, I mean, as you know, when we have interruptions in power, we have boil water ordinances all the time. And all that stuff adds up. So, I mean, I guess if you're comparing the two as a budget disaster versus natural disaster, I would say it's far more likely based upon the information we've given and the, and the reticence being on Trump too, that's far more, it's almost guaranteed we're gonna have a climate disaster of some sort, we might have a budget disaster. Even though I would caution that until we see all the numbers and how they're spending the money on reoccurring versus non-reoccurring expenses, we might have a current budget disaster right now. So who knows? We'll know when we get the budget in May. And, and the over. last thing to me is interesting, interesting is one of the few uh, public debates I've heard uh, where there's no compromise position in terms of phased in approach or part of uh, our investment versus waiting. So just, it's just it's rather interesting. Thank you for that information. We've got a decision to make. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I, I guess I would just say this very quickly before I ask two follow up questions to Mr. White. You know, we've been hearing about these budget issues and every time we've worked them out. So um, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm a little nonplussed because we have heard when we didn't roll the millages forward that there could be layoffs. That didn't happen. Um, we've we've had other things. And so we've we've worked through those and we were committed to try and balance everything out. Mr. White, to that point um, that Councilmember Morrell made and one to that Councilmember Thomas made, does the city have an analysis of delay, whether that uh, affects supply chain issues? In other words, do we have a guarantee by not moving forward that there won't be a supply chain issue here? Um, um, to your point, I want to go back to the first statement and come back to your, your second, your question. You're right, we've been able to work the budget out largely because we've had these other funding coming to the federal government to help it, right? Apart from the millages um, statement, we did, we did bring in CARES Act money, which was a direct infusion to the city's general fund. The ARP dollars clearly were grant related and we use that to plug it. That's why we use all of the money to plug it within the last year's budget. We appropriated that collectively. Now to your point is if there's a study with supply chain issues, um, I, I don't know the answer to that question because it wouldn't have been me. It may have been with Sue and Water Board. But what we're referring to is we're, we agree that the project needs to be moved forward. We agree with that. We're simply saying three months. We're sim because by then May will be here, the beginning of May, that April time frame, which we received the, um, received the money. Now, if there's some sort of supply chain issue that would affect us more than it already has, I don't know what that is. I think the supply chain issue, su supply chain issue was greater when the pandemic started and they've been working it out. I, I do agree with you, it does exist. I don't know the answer to your question, but we're simply saying use a second try to put. Um, I, I get it, but but I think I think I feel much more comfortable looking people in the eye saying, "I took a risk, not waiting for there to be a supply chain issue, and then there is there does become one by waiting another couple of months." Particularly when everybody everybody said in the summertime, time is of the essence. So that's that that would be number one. Number two um, question would be this. Um, for zero-based budgeting, what should happen at the end of the year is there should be little to no surplus or fund balance in somebody's account. Is that right? No, that's not true. Okay. Well, why? Yeah, I thought and, that and was I thought that was the whole point of zero. Yeah. I mean, I, I love logic council member Thomas lean in. Isn't that the whole point of zero-based budgeting? Is you build a budget so somebody starts off the year and you say your budget's a dollar and you spend to a dollar. The whole thing is supposed to be spent. So in, in other words, you should not be seeing fund balance where zero-based budgeting has been implemented. I, I think I got that right, huh? Well, well I, I can answer that question. And how, this is how I look at it. The budget itself, even though we talk in numer numerical terms, is actually the plan to operate the city. That the, in, the investments are the funds, but it's a plan going forward. For example, if we bring new programs in place, we have to fund those programs. But we can't get started hiring anyone or buying anything because we first need the funding to do so. So as a result of it, you're always going to have a lag between placing that money there and begin to start to use it. Because the type of government we exist in, we can't create a PO unless the money's there. We can't even go out and requisition for anyone until the money's there. So by the time we appropriate those dollars and then we start moving to bring in those folks, 
there are going to be times we can anticipate some who may leave to other positions because they get more money. That turnover savings will always create a surplus. And when other programs come in place, may create a deficit, but it is a plan is what I'm referring to. So you're gonna have those ebbs and flows that cause it. The, 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 the issue why we're having an extenuating circumstance now is simply because we held back from hiring and we're trying to ramp back up. I do agree uh, there are turnover savings which we can adjust to once we get to the back end of the budget, once we know what the realities are, but we can't move forward unless the plan exists. I, I get it, but I, I, I just, either one of us must have a fundamental misunderstanding that of zero-based budget. Because my understanding is by implementing zero-based budgeting, the whole goal is that a department at year end will have zero left because they budgeted for their needs or close to it. And we may have to adjust. That's not what a zero-based budget program is. A zero-based budgeting program is you budget the dollars to the program exactly each year. Well, because I, I, of the don't, plan. I, don't, because I don't understand the difference. What's the difference? Well, the difference is, is simply because if you're funding a program, if we're hiring up, say, for police, and we have a special program that we're adding 50 more cops, then you have to fund for those 50 more cops. Now, okay. at the end of the day, you hire those and 10 leave, you're going to have a difference in those things. So I, it can't be exact is what I'm I, 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 I agree with you, but I think, I think the point where we do agree is take JJIC, for example. Their actual budget was for 75 employees, and at year end, they had 52. I mean, you know, if a zero-based budgeting system were in place that were correct, they would not have a fund balance for whatever reason. But that's what the goal is supposed to be, is to build it in a way. And if we decide in the middle of the year they need more employees or operating things change or they need more equipment, then that becomes part of the conversation. All right, I've, I've talked too much. Councilmember Moreno, Green, then Councilmember Thomas to see if your hand back up. And then I think we're going to foreclose <laughs> discussion after the third round of, of coming back. And Norm, you've been patient with us. So we appreciate that. Just a, a couple of, Moreno. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of brief questions. So I'm hearing a, a lot of different, um, you know, what ifs being being thrown out there. And and Mr. White, I just have to ask this question. You know, I've read in the, in the newspaper um, different comments from Mr. Green about concerns about ownership, about concerns about looking about uh, looking at other options. Are you just bringing up this this issue of utilizing the second tranche to try to delay the project so that there could be, I guess, more time to look at other options or ownership stuff? Like, what what are is, is that in play in any way? I just need to get a firm answer on that from you. And, and I could give you an unequivocal answer. My statement and strategy from the administration for two years now have always been the same. It hasn't come up when the conversation of ownership has come about. We've always said use the first tranche for revenue loss. The mayor fought for the money to come directly here. My, our words haven't changed. They're being, they have been consistent. So absolutely not. We, we always propose a strategy to protect the revenue loss first to make sure we provide the services and then move from there. And so this is not, this, this utilizing the second tranche piece isn't some type of delay tactic. I, I, would, I would suggest that we go back and look at all the other presentation that we've given. It has been consistent for this very reason I'm speaking to. Okay. I don't think that's really a yes or no answer. Um, no, I, but... I, I gave you the answer. The answer I said is that it was that simply to protect the revenue losses of the operating budget for no other reason, simply that. So then let me ask you this. So, you know, yesterday there was this, this plan presented. I haven't actually, it hasn't been shown to me, but I saw it, um, you know, based on news reports about a potential public safety plan on, on retention. And, and really it was put out there like, look, you know, all that we really need now is for civil service and the, and the council to move this plan forward. But now we're, what I'm hearing, though, is that that's actually not the case. The case is that's not going to move forward until we get a second tranche of money from the, um, the ARPA funds. Is that correct? Well, what I'm going to do to see Ale would, would have been here. I know you may have heard he's a little bit sick today. So the key would be is I look forward to him I'm presenting the entire plan to you. He is the project manager of it. I think he can answer the detailed questions you have regarding. But but you did say that the the, the, the goal was to use the second tranche. Yes, it would be utilized from the second tranche. So, um, but that that's something that I that I was not aware of because I thought that 
the way that was presented yesterday. And once again, I, I, I've not seen it. Maybe other council members have been presented with this plan. Support with but the way that it was put out there is that, look, we want to do this plan immediately. Public safety is a huge priority. We need to move forward with this ASAP. What we need is the, the, the council support. Let's move this through. And look, I mean, it sounded like it's, it's a very urgent and good plan. I certainly want to work on retaining officers and do whatever it takes. But, you know, now it seems like that plan will likely be delayed several months now until I, May. I'm not sure of that. I think that's why, I'm sorry. I you said that the second tranche wouldn't be coming until May? Right. So what I'm going to suggest is that when Mr. Mart on my computer, you're coming in and out. It may just be my broadband low connection. So I apologize if I'm interrupting you or can't hear fully. So I want to make sure I'm answering your question. Can you repeat your question for me? I just said that, and, and I hope I'm coming through clearly. You are now. Seems that this plan that was put out yesterday to the media that really we can't move forward on it until May when and if we should get the second tranche. No, I think what I'm saying is I'm going to wait till Mr. Montano presented because his strategies made me moving forward in a different way than I know. But the goal is to use a second tranche. The goal has always been to take the first tranche and secure our operating budget and then move forward on the second tranche for other things. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Weston. Thank you, Madam President. Councilmember Green, Councilmember Thomas. Councilman Jerusalem, I have just um, one question. I appreciate you coming back. I, I want to ask Mr. White, um, to the extent that you can, could you comment on your level of confidence in our receiving the, the second um, pool of money, the second tranche of funds? Um, I am confident that we'll receive it. The problem is, since I'm not the one distributing, I can't be 100%, which is why we're moving in the direction and the way that we're moving. All I can do is say I'm confident, but I can't be 100% assured. Are you That's fairly, why I'm fairly confident? Um, Are you fairly confident? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm confident based on the conversation and the commitment from the federal level, but I'm not assured. And I don't know by me saying very confident or otherwise would improve the conditions of it. I'm moving in a way we protect the operating budget and then making sure we can go forward so we can now utilize and present the entire program. Um, I don't know because I'm not distributing it. I can't assure you of anything with any great significance that will please me or you or I, I just know where I can do it. But I'm, I'm confident, don't know any more I can say about it. Right, and I, I just want to tell you that I'm looking forward to working with you. I mean, Councilman, Councilman Moreno's question though is a very good question because it's gonna involve a lot more discussion um, as to how reliant on the second tranche of money is this um, plan which everyone wants to see a plan, but at the end of the day, I'm asking for your level of confidence and I look forward to hearing from um, the CAO relative to his level of confidence too. Um, because I think that members of the public um, who are listening might feel that there is a potential problem in securing those resources and though they aren't guaranteed, we have letters of support, we've had conversations with officials on a federal level, plus we're making plans for a um, police potential pay increase based on the second tranche of money. I hope that um, we're very confident that it's going to come through. No, and I, I appreciate like your question. I and, and, I, and, I, right. no, and I look forward to um, working with you and discussing anything I make myself available. But And I listened to the presentation, and I think the mayor would agree that there is a great importance to building this alternative power source, no doubt about it. I don't think in those letters that anyone referred to using one tranche or the other. I think we're aligned. I think we're aligned to finding money to fund the program. I think the second tranche is still ARP dollars, which is consistent with the letters I think were presented in the presentation. What I don't see within the presentation that they all say, let's use the first tranche, risk the operations of the city, and then move forward. So in that regard, I think we're all aligned. We can use ARP dollars, but let's not re uh, risk the existing service that we already appropriated within the budget and the strategies going forward and just move it to the second tranche. And then we all are in line. I don't think those letters say anything different. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you for being here for so long. Thank you to my colleagues. Um, I realize this has been a longer 
discussion than I would have anticipated, but I think it's healthy that everybody's weighing in that we do this. Uh, before I call the question, Mr. Shai or Mr. Harang, do we have any public comments on items number four and five? There are no um, germane comments for any item on the agenda for this meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Shai. With that, um, I'm gonna move for approval of item number four, ordinance calendar number 33617. May I have a second, please? And, and, and before, before I get a second, let me just explain. This is to create a fund for the substation. This is the first thing that we'll be voting on. And the second part is to appropriate and expend the money on the substation that will then go into the fund. So that, that the first order of business is on the fund. I have moved, may I have a second? Second. Second by Council Member Moreno. Uh, Mr. Shai, will you please uh, uh, call the roll? No, I'm mute, sorry about that. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. Council Member Moreno? Yes. Council Member Morrell? Yes. Council Member Green? Yes. Council Member Thomas? Yes. The vote passes. Thank you. And Mr. Shai, on these next two, do we need to vote on 16, 18, 16, 19 separately or one vote cover both? You can do those in Globo. Let's do those in Globo then, sir. I will move for approval then of item number five, ordinance calendar numbers 33618 and 33619. I'll second. Second by Vice President Morrell. I'll, I'll call the vote. I, and I vote and what, what, does, what does this vote do? This is the appropriation, the expenditure. Um, and, and, and the way that it is written is to use ARP or other funds to be able to, to appropriate to the uh, substation fund. Does it designate first tranche versus second tranche? Or it does not. Okay. It does not. And, and, and because I think council member Thomas, I think, I think a couple of things. One is because of the, the little bit of uncertainty of how much was actually left untouched, number one. Number two, I think all the questions we all have about how much is really an operating right now versus really fund balance right now. And then, and then you know, particularly down the road, if we can work with somebody, do they need the full 30 up front, then to be able to work and have that flexibility. So I purposely sort of drafted it that way to it's give us- a, It's been an excellent debate, man. I think you've chaired this the way you need to to get that type of input. You've done a good thank, job. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, your 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 experience in saying that means a lot. I appreciate it. So I've moved, been seconded by Council Member Morena. Mar, I'm sorry, Morell. Yeah. Um, Mr. Shai, will you please uh, count the votes? Council Member Jeruso. Yay. Council Member Moreno. Yes. Council, Council Member Morrell? Yes. Council Member Green? Yes. Council Member Thomas? Yes. Vote is unanimous. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you for everybody. Um, and as I said at the top, we're going to go out of order a little bit, keep on going down for these next items, which are all related. Um, and I know Council Member Moreno has been an integral part in working on, on these um, this relates council members to the issue of what happens if your car is stolen, carjacked, somebody else appropriates it for some reason, and then it gets towed and stored and, and also your ability to recover those funds. Um, it first actually came to me through a friend of the family who this happened to. And I said, oh my gosh, this is, just has to be a mistake. We must have charged you wrong. And then there was a report, I think, on one of the news stations where they confirmed that this was happening. So Council Member Moreno and I, and I know she has um, an explanation of also the work she did in the legislature to work on this beforehand, wanted to do something to make sure that citizens aren't victimized twice. We shouldn't have your car stolen and then you have to pay for the privilege of getting your car returned to you. So my ordinance um, makes clear, I think, what the state law already is. Uh, in that regard, Council Member Moreno, I'll let you explain what you have. The only small thing I want to add about ours is we are also in contact with the red light company about how they can make this process very easy to if you happen to get a red light um, while your car is stolen or has been taken out of your possession. They are working with us to streamline that process. But if your car 
is stolen or towed or you receive a parking ticket um, because those are controlled through the city of New Orleans, um, you, you will no longer be charged from that once we pass, assuming we pass these ordinances. So council member Moreno, I know you have companion ordinances and I yield the floor to you. Sure, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So the way that I uh, learned about what was happening with folks who were having their cars stolen and then having to pay to uh, get them back was actually from Morgan LaMondre. And Morgan is with Star Advocates and she has worked closely with Councilmember Morell and I, uh, back when we were in the legislature on a, a variety of different bills, mostly focusing on helping victims of sexual assault. But in our work, what we did in 2017 um, was amend what is called Louisiana's um, Victims Bill of Rights uh, Act or legislation. And what we had noticed is that there was a portion of that um, legislation that needed to be amended because victims were getting charged fees to get either um, property that was utilized as evidence back or stolen property back. So in 2017, we, we made that amendment saying that those items shall, shall be returned to the victim or the victim's family at no cost. And, and Council Vice President Morrell, I actually believe you handled that bill for me on the Senate floor uh, when it came to, to final passage. So when Morgan LaMondre called me about this, that here in the city of New Orleans, we were charging people to get their, their stolen vehicles back. I was like, wait, that's not, that's not possible. You know, I mean, that's against state laws as, as, as we had passed. So I notified the city attorney and said, hey, look, I think we're in violation of, of state law. Obviously um, our executive council reviewed it and, and, and thought that, you know, yes, we have an argument here that, that, that yes, the city's in violation of state law. Um, also sent the memo to uh, a memo to the CAO. And, um, you know, all I received back was that it was still going to be, that that, that was going to be under, under review and that they were looking at whether, you know, some local ordinances allowed them to, to, to charge individuals. But once again, as we all know, I mean, we've got lawyers on the council and then and two, and, and myself being a former legislator, uh, the state law is going to trump whatever local ordinance we have as far as um, charging victims of crime to get their stolen cars back. So, as I started to, to work through this process, I found out that Councilmember Jeruso had also been contacted about this issue and was working on a local ordinance to ensure that there is no question that here in the city of New Orleans, we're not going to charge victims of crime to get their, their stolen property back. But at the same time, I also believe that it is very important to work to reimburse individuals who um, have been charged to to retrieve their stolen property back and it's in violation to the law enacted in 2017. So because of that, I have um, two pieces of, of legislation, which I hope to get um, all of you all to co-author the entire budget committee, which first creates a fund uh, with, at, the, at this moment, we're gonna start with roughly $150,000 of fund balance so that individuals can be reimbursed. Um, those who have, you know, had to pay to get their stolen property back, that's in violation to the 2017 Act. And then number two, uh, the other ordinance that I have is it directs the CAO to come up with a process to uh, reimburse these individuals back. And one, one thing I do want to mention is I likely will have an amendment to the CAO directive because I think I'm going to put a timeline on it of, you know, roughly 30 days to come up with a process so that you know, we're not waiting, you know, six months from now or whatever to, to get something um, going. So that's that's what my instruments do. And it's a little bit of history as to how we got here. But at the same time, you know, I don't think it's fair to, at the end of the day, rob victims twice. You know, they've already had their property stolen. Um, there's, there's no need to go and charge them to go and just retrieve back their, um, their vehicles in those cases. And I'll say this too, that um, you know, in, in some of these cases, the, the, the owner was never even notified if they wanted to retrieve the car at the scene where it was recovered, or if, if they wanted their car towed, their car was just towed. And so, you know, there could have been even some opportunities there if victims had been contacted to, you know, not even have to deal with the whole process of picking up a car from a tow lot, um, but just picking it up at the scene where it had been recovered if the car was still um, able to be driven away. Um, so the, the, that's what, what, what my particular uh, legislative items do. Happy to take any question and appreciate 
um, all of you all helping with this, in particular, uh, Council Chair Jerusa. Thank you, Madam President. Council Member Morrell, your hands up. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. First off, I appreciate both of you bringing uh, ordinances to address the issue. But I want to tackle two points that I think are very important. One, <clears throat> I did in fact handle the bill on the Senate side and Helena was very good, always giving me good bills as a handoff to carry him over the finish line. And I appreciate it being part of that team in the legislature. But I want to put something out there to make everyone aware. I've been contacted with people as far back as 2020 who were carjacked and had to pay to get their vehicles back. This is not a new process. The city has been in, been violating the law probably since we passed the law in 2017. And I've talked to at least two people who were out hundreds, at one point, a thousand dollars to try and get their vehicle back. So I don't know if 150 is going to cover it because I do feel like we need to make sure that as long as someone has the documentation to prove that they were ripped off in this deal, they can attempt to get their money back. The other thing which I found equally troubling is when NOPD was challenged on this practice, they hid behind the Louisiana towing statute. One, it's not applicable because as you said, this portion of the law you created is the most recent version of law, trumps all previous law. That's, that's the way the law works. But more importantly, is a, the other part of the Louisiana towing statute is that if someone cannot afford to get their vehicle out timely, the towing company owns the vehicle. So when you're looking back at this problem, as far back as it may go, we don't know how many people lost their vehicles because they couldn't slap the money together to pay the towing company from the illegally seized vehicle. And so I just want to make sure that we understand. I support the ordinance, if anything, like I'm definitely going to co-author it. I just want to make us all aware if people can provide documentation, the number might be larger. The last thing I want to say, and I'll use Morgan as an example, is when, when a public records request was placed upon NOPD to show how many cars were affected by this policy, they basically, basically said, can't tell you no mas. That is unconscionable and ridiculous. The fact that they can't produce a number on how many vehicles that have been towed, just that basic issue, how many vehicles have been towed by towing companies on an average day on an average year? Even that would have been helpful to figure out how many victims have actually been, been affected because as it stands now, no matter what we say and what the media does, there are victims who will never know we did this and will probably never get their money back just because we can't reach out to them unless we have kind of PSA to say this is available. So it's really unfortunate this practice took place. It bothers me tremendously that if the NOPD is doing its job, if it is taking information on stolen vehicles, one of the people I spoke to, who we all know, said he had to call twice to get an item number for them to acknowledge they were to say his car got stolen. I mean, if you're doing reports and you're actively trying to get someone their car back, that means you know who the owner is and you know the vehicle was stolen. And if you know the vehicle is stolen, What's the period between when the vehicle was discovered and when it was towed? Was it a day? Was it an hour? We don't know. But the fact that we have to do this and they couldn't take the steps to go and say, this was a stolen vehicle. The person is likely dealing with the fact they have no vehicle. Let's give them some time. Let's send an officer to their house to knock on the door to let them know we found their car. This seems to stink of the kind of apathy that makes people angry at government that someone was too lazy to find out who owned this vehicle and give them an opportunity to pick it up. Because as both Council Member Moreno and Council Madruso have said, what's worse than being victimized by a brutal attacker stealing your car is when apathetic government charges you for the privilege of getting your car back. That's unconscionable. And I mean, I'm glad we're doing this. As Council President Moreno previously stated, it's kind of ridiculous because the NOPD won't acknowledge state law that we have to do this. Because they just said, you know what? You brought to our attention 
this practice is completely illegal. As an administration, this practice is completely illegal. We're going to do it. The, the, the CAO could put, could put out a, an order right now stopping this practice if they wanted to. And I know Councilmember Moreno sent a letter to him asking him to do it, and he has not done so. So the council is acting in the absence of government correcting itself and saying, we now know this is illegal, let's fix it ourselves. Yet again, we're cleaning up other people's messes, but I'm happy to co-author everything. I'm happy to find the money to pay for this fund, which will probably be far more than 150 grand at the end of the day, but it's just sad and unfortunate that we have to do this because government couldn't fix it itself. Thank you. Council Chair uh, Jeruso, I just wanted to answer a couple of Council Morrell's um, points um, that he made. So um, first, uh, Council Vice President, I totally agree with you. I think it's going to be more than $150,000, but that's just a start and we can add more to the fund as, as we go. So the other piece too is I, I was um, contacted by a couple of former city employees who saw Ms. LaMondre's tweet about uh, the response an OPD gave her that said, we don't have a list of these stolen vehicles. And these former employees told me that she should have been told that actually the agency who does have a list of these stolen vehicles is OPCD, Orleans Parish Communication District. So what I have found out is that apparently they do have a list, which um, the council's requesting, but apparently the list only goes back about three years. So hopefully we get that list in a very timely fashion. And, you know, obviously we can um, revise the fund based on that. But I think it once again goes to show that, you know, the, 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 it would have been so simple just to tell Ms. LaMondre that, hey, you know, uh, the information is with OPCD or we got the information from OPCD for, for you. And so, you know, once again, it just goes to, you know, how we, how the city treats victims or those working on behalf of victims. So we'll, we'll get this information from Ms. LaMondre. Um, and I know she's going to file another public records request to try to get it. But once again, just these, these unnecessary hoops that victims or those advocating for victims have to jump through are just really frustrating and, and disappointing. Um, but thank you, Council Member Morrell, for, for, for uh, offering to co-author. Um, I really appreciate your support. Council Chair Jerusalem. Thank you, Madam President. Council Member Thomas. First of all, thank you uh, to the two authors of the ordinance. And uh, I think Council Member Morrell just spoke for uh, everybody that's ever experienced any hardship, uh, unfairness in this town from Katrina to FEMA to uh, marijuana laws and how they're applied now versus how they were applied to people who've been carjacked or, or towed. And, and I think the spirit of what, what he just stated uh, represents what too many people have gone through in this town is that even when we find a wrong, uh, there's rarely a uh, remedy. Uh, but I would just uh, caution uh, my colleagues on one thing. Uh, I don't know that it's going to rain money at some point. And when you're dealing with unknowns, it's always better to know how much than uh, how much you think. Uh, because at some point, how much versus how much you think of what the realities are, once, once you get to that crossroads, then real decisions about uh, money uh, have to be made. But I just appreciate uh, on behalf of everyone who's lived here, uh, who's uh, experienced disparity, uh, who, who've experienced being an afterthought, uh, who watch FEMA disbursements and uh, Katrina neglect and, and, and to what I said earlier about how marijuana laws have been applied or were applied. I think that's just kind of been the nature of how government has worked. So uh, if there has been a hardship, a hardship before that matches this ordinance or this effort, it should definitely be considered, but I would much rather know how much than guess how much, uh, so we don't have to guess who we're going to help in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ma thank you, Council Member Thomas. Um, all right. Well, uh, I, I don't. We have no public comment at all, so we've had a commentary from everybody. This is what I would like to do. We'll just go in order. Um, and Council Member Moreno, at least I can speak for myself, I would like to add my name to your ordinances as well. I know Council Member Morrell said the same thing. 
Council Member Green, Green. You, yes. Green would like Thank to do Green. it. Council Member Thomas, I know you're on mine. Yeah, I mean, th those are kind of ordinances that, uh, especially issues like that with the public that, uh, you know, usually unless someone doesn't want to be on it, that you add the body to. Love it. Thank you so much, Council Member. All right, well, let's start with item number six and then um, we'll go from there. I will move to approve item number six, ordinance calendar number 33616. May I have a second, please? Green, second. Second by Council Member Green. Mr. Shy. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. Council Member Moreno. Yes. Council Member Morrell. Yes. Council Member Green. Yes. Council Member Thomas. Yes. The vote is unanimous. Thank you, sir. On to the next item. Um, I hand it over to you, Council Member Moreno, for items seven and eight. Make a motion to adopt if I can get a second, please. Second. Seconded by Council Vice President Morrell. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. Council Member Moreno. Yes. Council Member Morrell. Yes. Council Member Green. Yes. Council Member Thomas. Yes. Vote is unanimous. Let me take the next one, Bill. Yes, ma'am. So um, next, I believe uh, we are at uh, calendar numbers 33623 and 33624. I'll make a motion to adopt. Second. Seconded by Council Member Jeruso. You'll be. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. Council Member Moreno? Yes. Council Member Morrell? Yes. Council Member Green? Yes. Council Member Thomas? That's a yes. <laughs> yes. What is unanimous? Thank you all. All right, members, this is what I'd like to do now. Why don't we go? Um, to the beginning of the agenda, approve the minutes and get through the budget reports. And then we can decide whether or not we want to vote on the rest of the items right now in committee. I know it's been long already, but I do think seeing the reports is incredibly important for us. So um, item number two now is approval of the minutes from the uh, January 25th, 2022 budget meeting. I'll entertain a motion to approve. To approve. Move okay. approved by... Approved by uh, Council Member Morrell, seconded by Council Member Moreno. Council Member, Council Member, Mr. Shy, will you please call the uh, call the roll on this? The vote. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. Council Member Moreno. Yes. Council Member Morrell. Yes. Council Member Green. Yes. Council Member Thomas. Yes. Vote is unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Shy. All right, um, let's get to the budget presentations. I know um, Mr. McElroy usually makes these and we've been keeping him waiting. Uh, is there somebody on the line who can walk us through these presentations? There he is. There you go. Hey, Mr. McElroy, how are you doing? Oh, we got you on mute. All right, how about now? It should work. We can hear you now. Appreciate it. Paul, will you please okay. pull up the presentations? Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you for having me here. Let's see. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? Oh, okay, so we'll do them in this order, which I think is slightly different from on the agenda, but uh, we'll cover them all. Um, I should note the staffing report um, was put together by uh, CAO. Um, we don't, I don't think we have anybody on the call uh, still who, uh, who can do that, but uh, I think Norm uh, will be able to uh, at least give some of that um, when we come to that part. Um, okay, so can I have the next slide, please? Uh, okay, sorry, next one. Um, oh, here we go. Okay. This is, uh, I should point out, um, this is January through December uh, 2020 includes uh, items from 
uh, from the calendar month of January 2021 that were accrued back uh, where uh, we have not done that yet this year. So January 2022 items, which will ultimately uh, be cataloged into 2021 are not there. Uh, so this is a little bit comparing uh, apples and oranges, uh, but we can still get some of the picture. Not everything will be accrued. Um, the first thing to point out, uh, property tax is slightly down uh, because we did not send out the property tax bills in December as we usually would uh, because there were uh, millage items on the ballot in the December process can only start once we know the result of that. Uh, so those will be sent out a little bit later uh, or the, will be sent out this year. Ordinarily, you would pick up uh, some money right there at the end, um, either late payers who finally realize there's no more months of this year to pay or uh, people paying up, up ahead, um, which we didn't catch. But with property tax money, those that will just come in later uh, instead of in coming in in December of 2021, it will come in, <coughs> excuse me, in a later month. So ultimately, it will still be there. Uh, the other thing to point out is for other taxes, there will be an entire other month uh, tacked onto this, <coughs> excuse me, uh, once all the accruals are done. Uh, and the month looks pretty good. The, the calendar month of January 2022 uh, is not entirely accrued, but almost entirely. Uh, and it looks pretty healthy so far. So this is actually a very uh, encouraging result um that the you know we are on the road to recovery at least in certain things such as you know hotel visits and sales tax and that sort of thing um, i don't have the exact figures in front of me uh, for how much will be um, added to this but it uh, should be uh, basically a, a pretty robust month uh, added on top which of course uh, we'll be able to give more specific details about that later um where we do see a drop uh, relative to last year that is not does not look like it's going to come up significantly uh, where there not be another month added uh, in other words is in licenses and permits these are some of our longer term effects of the pandemic that we have been dealing with and you know we saw this happen in the whole time so it's not a huge surprise when we see it here uh, either things uh, you know delayed because of the hurricane or just the pandemic generally uh, you know a lot of a lot of different uh, moving parts around here that have sort of all contributed to uh, lower revenue there uh, but again, this is kind of in line with what we had been seeing, so this doesn't take us by surprise. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, sorry, unless there are any questions on this slide. Okay. Uh, otherwise, we uh, the, the rest of these categories, uh, again, uh, and I say this every time, um, in Section 4, service charges, and Section 6, miscellaneous, we had the one-time revenues. Uh, of the uh, CARES Act and uh, Harris money that came in in those years in 2020 that have, did not show up in 2021. 2021 looked more like a normal year in those terms. Uh, so if we can remove those, uh, you know, the, the comparison is a lot closer. Uh, 2021 looks more like we should expect in these. Intergovernmental revenue, uh, slightly lower, but some of this is just when payments are made and that just happens. Um, there should be another uh, Medicaid UPL payment that comes, whether that'll be booked into 2021 or 2022, uh, you know, ultimately the money will still be received. It's just, uh, it's not on the fixed schedule. Um, some of these other items here, fines and forfeits, uh, slightly down, but um, we might still have some of this, uh, a small amount of this still coming in uh, due to the nature of how they're posted. Bottom line, uh, we are slightly down from the target, as you can see, uh, total revenue for 2021, 93% of budget. Again, some of that money will come in uh, just at a slight delay so that it will no longer be in 2021, but will still be here. Uh, some of it, uh, as in licenses and permits, appears basically to just, that's it's just gone. Um, and uh, the 2020 total was heavily inflated by a lot of one-time money, but uh, they're fairly comparable. Um, Next meeting, perhaps, or uh, certainly by the meeting after that, we will have a, um, you know, as the audit progresses, as the accruals are made, as all these accounting changes are made, uh, and, and 2021 is finalized, uh, we'll have a much clearer picture. It will be higher than this 591 here. Um, it may not quite be, uh, you know, as high as we'd hoped, but it will be, uh, should be substantially uh, at least higher than uh, on sales tax. Do I have any questions? Here? Oh, and I'm sorry. And then, of course, we will begin to uh, 
next we will begin to compare 2022 versus 2021. This is just our, our catch up here. Uh, do I have any questions on the revenue presentation? Anybody? All right. Go ahead, Mr. McElroy, the next one. All right, thank you. Um, if we can move along to the personnel spending forecast. This, uh, for basically for all of the spending, uh, for this one and the next one, uh, it's important to notice this is a very small sample size. Uh, money's not spent evenly throughout the year. Uh, different departments have different needs uh, or different, you know, some things peak uh, around Mardi Gras, some things peak in the summer. Uh, and this is basically very small sample size. Uh, and I, I really don't feel comfortable drawing any conclusions uh, from any of the first month stuff. I mean, we have the report, we're going to show it to you. Uh, but it's, uh, I would say it, it would be too early for concern just yet uh, about any of these things. Um, Let's see, for example, uh, you know, police will, uh, you know, the carnival season will be a big time for them. So uh, some of the uh, things that, you know, money that they will spend, just they would not have spent it by uh, February 3rd when this report was produced, uh, that they will spend, for example, you know, and uh, nor is another one they, they spend heavily in the summer um, so that it's not, it doesn't really give us any picture uh, right now of, of um, you know, that they're at almost 20% surplus here. That's that's just a kind of an artifact. All told, um, not a lot of specific things to point out here, uh, like I said, because of the small sample size. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, again, same thing here. This just continues. Every Basically, everything throughout the city is going to uh, have this similar issue where uh, just because of the small sample size and different schedules, uh, we can't draw a lot of conclusions. It, it would be lovely if we had a massive surplus uh, at the end of the year, at, you know, as is uh, indicated here, but uh, that's, we, you know, we, we don't expect that. So uh, I have some specific, uh, or excuse me, I can take specific questions if anybody has them, but that, that caveat covers uh, almost all of possible specific questions, I think. Councilmember Morrell. Uh, Mr. McElroy. A quick question. When I look on the first page of personnel services spending projection, I see that JJIC has its own item number. Is it not housed within another department of the city? Um, Paul, may I, uh, can, can we go back to that slide? <clears throat> Excuse me. It's just way on one slide there, that slide right there. Um, you know, the, the specific internal breakdown of all of these, uh, I, I don't always remember off the top of my head. Some of these are broken out. Um, they should be their own item number. Council member, I can assist with this. Um, JGIC um, has the agency number 380, which is the actual charter agency number for human services. So um, when they did the um, executive order doing JGIC, it just referred to the name instead of instead of changing the charter of the ancient name, they just referred to it on documents as juvenile justice intervention center. But okay, it's so, reflective but, of human services. Okay, so 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 it falls under health and human services. It falls under the, its own agency called um, human services. So it's 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 own it's its own department. Okay, so so basically it's because the charter the charter acknowledges health and human services, JJIC is coded under health and human services. Essentially, it's a, just the a Department of Human Services, and it just coded under there, but it's, it's functioning as the same, functioning doing the same services. Okay, thank you. Yep. Wait, real, thank President you for that, Yubi. Real, real quick, Council Vice President Morrell, what's weird about that is that if you look on the city's website for the Office of Youth and Families, it says that it's the Office of Youth and Families that, quote, provides oversight and support for the Juvenile Justice Intervention Center. So that, I just that, wanted that's to. Where I, that, that's where I was going. It's just it, it's wor words matter and budget numbers matter, and it doesn't make much sense to me that on the guiding budget document where it's identified where it falls, if other agencies can just sort of claim it, it doesn't yeah. seem to make much sense. So I mean, it's something we can dig into in the regular budget process, but it makes sense where it is currently. I just I was aware that different agencies that are not human services, at least two claim to have some control over it. And it doesn't make much sense if it's got its own item number. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other member on this? All right, Mr. McElroy. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, thanks for bringing this uh, issue to my attention. I had not, uh, uh, Council Member uh, Morell, I had not um, noticed that actually. Uh, so uh, if we can continue on to the next section, operating expenses, uh, again, we, we have the similar, um, the, the similar explanation as before where we just have such a small sample size here. So, you know, personnel spending may not, uh, it does not necessarily flow evenly and um, operating expenditures other than personnel certainly is, could, could be way up and down um, such that with our uh, small sample size here, basically one month, um, I don't, uh, I would not myself draw any conclusions out of this just yet. Um, it is possible. I mean, some of these things we know, uh, you know, again, we know some things are going to see greater expenses for carnival season. Uh, some things are going to see greater expenses, you know, at certain known times, but uh, through January, almost, um, you know, none of these major things have happened yet. Um, so I don't have a lot of specific uh, information for the uh, this section and is, unless anybody has any questions. Oh, I'm sorry, if we could go to the next page. As wait, well. wait, Council Member Morrell. Council Member Morrell, hold on. He's got his hand back up. Uh, uh, sorry, Mr. McElroy, you almost I'm got sorry, away. I'm sorry, Mr. McElroy. I'm no, like, not a problem, yeah. please. Um, it makes sense when I'm looking at the total obligation budget for one month. Some of these numbers make sense, but when I see that 94% of a budget is already obligated in the first month of the year. Why is that? That seems very confusing. Because I mean, have, have they paid forward all of their expenses for the whole year in the first month? I, I can answer that question okay. if you can hear me. Thank you. Yeah, so how it works, if you look at it, you're right. If you look at the year-to-date expenditures, those are actual invoices paid. Okay. The encumbered and committed pieces are what departments are obligating and earmarking their fundings for their program to set aside those programs and for future payouts to go up underneath if, if, if you get what I'm saying. For example, if we're, um, if we're looking at say cleaning services, um, cleaning services say if it cost a million a year or a one, uh, 1.2 a year, million a year is 100,000 per month. Do we mean? don't allocate 100,000 per month, they would go ahead and obligate the entire $1.2 million for that program. And so you'll see um, um, that's how the budget, and it, it moves much smoother that way. That means um, funding is popping up on the POs, so the actual work can kind of move forward. So it's not that we spent it, it's just it's allocating the earmark for that purpose. That, that, that seems to make sense, and I'm assuming that personnel services spending projection versus operating expenditures. Is there overlap between the two? Um, when you, you're talking about the person, the personal service spending program, right? Yeah, we, we can't obligate, if you will, personnel services because they're employees of us It's not contractual related. What we do is look at the current expenditure piece um, that we expended for the first month or so and then project what that ending year will be. But we can't earmark it up underneath a contract or or any other um, program. It's okay. spend as you go. I guess the, 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 this is something we can work on, certainly going forward, Mr. White, but when I look at the obligation under human services, which is 95%, and we're aware now that JJIC, for example, is under human services, and based upon the information we got a couple of weeks ago that they had about only two-thirds of their actual positions filled, where would we have gotten a report that showed that that amount of, of fund balance was left there in a way that was easily digestible. Well, if you go back and, and I think you move from the operating to the personnel right. conversation, I want to make sure that the, that, that there's an understanding that the operating expenditure is simply um, the department's earmarking it to make things smoother. That's simply it, no spending. For the personnel projection piece, if you go back to the report itself, once we spend a dollar, we have, say, for example, uh, payroll expenditures. We can project based on those payroll expenditures going forward based on actual use. Oh, I see. The budget versus yes. spending projection. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because that's why, that could be why on your personal services spending, there's a projected 23.5% surplus because that's probably acknowledging the positions are not filled. So now I get it. Right. And so if I can say yes, and that's going forward, as, as we spoke in the last conversation, 
we had cut the budget by 20 percent stop hiring and everything so once we funded those positions clearly they're not here we just got to ramp up so that's consistent with the previous conversation if you get my point. right but but i guess well i mean some like i said we can work on offline but mm -hmm. i just want to make sure that as we're i'm a big proponent of tracking expenditures month to month because it's easier for me as far as when I was dealing with budgets at the state level to identify the trend of a surplus if you're following it month to month rather than waiting till the end of the year. Because I think when you look at companies that do that kind of the end of the year check-in, it lends to allowing or incentivizing departments to try and blow their budget at the end of the year to show it was spent. So I appreciate the operating being tracked this way because it allows us to track, you know, we'll be able to see when expenditures rat, ratchet up and be able to have follow-up questions as far as why it's ratcheted up in a given month. So that's my concern, but I think you're right. I think as far as the personal services spending projection, I think that's a good way, an illustration of that. That's kind of built into the way you track currently. Right. And to your point, if I can add, look, that's just, that's any financial person who's trying to control the budget um, over time, recognize that's what, departments do, right? We, right? we understand that. The PO program and the other operating um, capacity, as well as the personal spending, have controls um, so we know what needs to be spent versus just go ahead and just spend the money I have available. Because to, I think, uh, Councilman Jerusalem's um, point, that at some point we have to move money from one to cover because there's some unintended things that may occur in other areas. So we may need those funds to, to, to shift, if you will. So we have to have our handle on this to ensure those things can happen. Okay. Thank you, Mr. White. Sure. Thank you. And, and I guess, um, you know, one of the things, Norm, we can talk again offline about is, is I know we all want to dive into these presentations, making sure the council members have, you know, access to this in a meeting with the administration beforehand. So that way, sort of, particularly these, these rudimentary things we, we know about beforehand. And I appreciate the fact we met on Monday and that there was meeting with staff um, to try and, and look at these. And Councilman, I, I know and I appreciate the conversation that we had and, and the heads up on a lot of different things. And I think we all agree that um, our intent is to make sure these reports are comprehensive and also transparent. So if they're not if they're not understandable on the onset, we can adjust. And I think thank you, thank you. With that we can adjust. Thank you, Mr. White. I appreciate that. All right, Mr. McElroy, uh, my, my guess is the last one um, about FTEs is going to engender the most discussion. So everybody <laughs> buckle up for this one. Right. And, and uh, this one, I believe, like I said, uh, I, we should have had somebody from CAO here, but I, I think um, it, it may end up coming, uh, uh, be Norm's turn again uh, to talk about this. Is that correct, Norm? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take a yes. Um, Sorry to leave you with this, but that's okay. Norm, we always leave you like you're always the first person at the budget hearings. You always take the longest. You're here to deal with this one. So we appreciate that. I know. I feel like I need to have a flag jacket sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll make sure to appropriate one for you uh, for, for coming up. All right. Uh, hopefully it's on the second trot, though. That's right. <laughs> well played, right. Touche. <laughs> right. Um, to your point, I think this is going to be some of the things, the thread that we've had uh, for the beginning. I understand the strategies to say, Yep, we have these vacancies and therefore they're funding we're not gonna use. I get where we're headed here. But I wanna re, um, remind um, everyone again, when we went into the 2021 budget, we had to cut it a hundred million. So there were no hiring. What you, re, what you see in the budget category as personnel positions was our intent to ramp back up. And so you see the difference between the budget and the current position, you see that activity. So basically, um, the budget number is what we all approved in the, uh, the budget that was approved last November. The current FTE is simply where we stand right now as we begin to ramp back up. The vacancy rate is indicative of what the percentage is based on our strategy before and where we are now. Um, and you can look, I mean, and that's simply it on all of them. Now, to your point, the key would be is how quickly can we hire the positions that's in the budget is going to be the test, but we do know they need it in, in those respective areas. In some areas, uh, <clears throat> they may have to adjust in other ways, but clearly you can see um, the lining issues that everyone is sitting at um, some level of vacancy. 
um, if I don't have any concerns about anything, but if you go to the sales off with 40%, I think um, in those positions, um, he's ramping back up. I think where we want to get to, we see there's 268 with police. Um, I can just report the numbers, the operational activity associated with it. I think the department will have a better idea of explaining um, some of those items, but I think it is in totality our attempt to ramp back up for some of the cuts and um, 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 short spending that we've had in 2021 going forward. But if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer, answer them. But there's no individual individualistic problem with any department. We're just simply wrapping back up. I got it. Um, I, I'm good for right now. I asked some of my questions before. Councilmember Morrell. Yeah, obviously this number jumped out at me. I'm looking at the current as far as the budgeted and current for the police department in particular, they're budgeted for 1542. Is that licensed officers or just all employees for the police department? All employees for the police department. Okay. Because obviously it's public knowledge that the amount of licensed post-certified officers we have is somewhere between as the Glasser number of 900 to the Fergus number of 10, I think it was 1040. So I guess we can extrapolate that with that, there is about 220 to 300 civilian employees who are not licensed officers. I, I think I would reserve for the department to answer okay. that question. So let me, re, let me go ahead and amend my first statement. I'm gonna <laughs> say that these personnel number for police department are what's paid by general fund dollars. Okay, well then right. but maybe, so maybe, maybe uh, rather than rather than make you don your flak jacket, <laughs> we will, we'll, maybe Mr. Chairman, we should get the police department to come in and run these numbers because I think that if there is a shift to civilian employees versus licensed officers, there's kind of a public perception that we budget for 1600 officers. And I think that we need to kind of clear this up as far as is it 1600 officers, 1600 employees and what that looks like, but that's an NOPD question, not a Mr. White question. So I'll and if just- if you have any questions, we, you can submit it to me. We can do the financial- Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll follow up with them as far as figuring out what this number is and what it looks like, just because it would be important for us to know who is employed where, so that when we're talking to people in the public and expressing the public where staffing issues are or not, we're comparing apples to apples because a non-licensed officer is not an apple at that point, they're an orange or a banana. So we have to be able to say, to break those numbers out. So, but I'll, we'll follow with an OPD on that. Uh, the other issue is, I think that when I look at, it seems that we have some significant shortages in some of the most high demand departments, uh, safety and permits and city planning commission kind of jump out at me. And I appreciate that we're trying to figure out how to resolve that through unfreezing that hiring. But that's equally important, I think, to figure out when it comes to certain vacancies, why the vacancies exist. And by that, I mean that are the jobs not competitive? Or do we have a lack of people actually even applying for the jobs? Is it the salary? I think those important issues those are important issues we need feedback on because if we're going to try and budget for positions, that was the kind of the argument we got from JJIC as far as the pay was too too low, and that they were using the the money budgeted for positions for overtime. And the question we had then during that exchange was, it would make more sense to us that if you can't fill positions, come to us with a plan on how to fill it, which might mean fewer positions at a higher pay or something like that to get them filled. It doesn't help us or them to be understaffed if the current positions are so unattractive, no one will actually fill them. No, I think you make, you know, I make is a great point. And if I can go back, you're right. When I said in 2021, we just had a hiring freeze. You're right. right. And so we're wrapping back up. I know those are words I keep saying, but that's important for various reasons. One, after the pandemic started, I think we can see nationally, there's a problem with employment. There's a problem right, across right. every specter of any uh, type of discipline across the board. Now, how do we compete? Because never before have I seen, this is an employee market. I mean, you look at nurses, they're going in other places and making tremendous amount of money versus staying where they are. And I think we're seeing evidence of that now. We might have to address across the board and maybe not just in one particular area, 
how do we become competitive? And that's going to be quite a debate as we begin to shift money around within the budget and try to stay within that cap with a reoccurring conversation we just had. That no, I mean, that, that we have. I, I, I will fully acknowledge that that it's you're not going to have the non reoccurring fund argument without there being pain. It's just that my experience is better to have the pain than to have the cliff. So oh, absolutely. I, 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 I agree we should have that conversation. I agree maybe it's just as important to retain employees mm -hmm. as hire new ones. And it might require a deep dive analysis on all these various departments because it also doesn't make sense if we're actively seeking new employees, if we have employees that are considering leaving because we're not paying them appropriately. And I know, I, know for, I know for some businesses throughout the United States, especially larger ones, they've far gone actual new hiring just to reinforce the hires they have. And it may require us to say in a, depart in a given department, rather than hire 50% more people, we'll keep the budget at, you know, 40% less people with the ones that are there getting getting a pay raise based on shaving that 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 amount or that 10%. Like you see what I'm saying? So I think we need to look at all these positions and see what the turnover is because government positions are never highly paid. A lot of people, especially younger people, do not want to be civil servants. They kind of don't want to in, in get engage in the civil service pension system. And so we have to really figure out how we can make positions attractive so that we can keep the positions filled. But I, I didn't mean to have a diatribe. I no, appreciate no, I think I, no, I think that's a great point. I think we, we agree with that because simply if we can't protect our existing um, personnel, it's an is it's, it's a drain. It's 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 a drain on experience, know how and capability. And when you bring in a new person, you have to train them. So your capability is dropped um, a little bit. Um, when you lose experienced individuals, no doubt about that. I think the conversation, as you said, will come into play is how do we do that? How do we do that and add to it? And if we drop the number of people by giving others raises, then what is our projection of performance? That may have to reduce as well. So it's gonna be a debate regarding both ends, if you will. Yeah, and us yeah. all understand that if we give a department this, then here's a respective outcome of it. And being re realistic about that is gonna be important. No, I think I think that we're going to have to have a lot of conversations about realistic expectations for the city going forward on services, and especially in specific departments, as we kind of struggle with what the new revenue is going to look like. So, all okay. right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no more questions. Thank you, Councilmember Morrell. Uh, to, to the point sort of you raised, one thing I'm going to suggest and maybe even offer something about is, given all these concerns about using ARP money in the future and how positions are looking. Mr. White, maybe it'd be good for us to form a working group between the council, the mayor, NOPD, civil service, um, somebody who's a representative of either FOP or PANO, because um, I think it'd just be wise for us to try and hash that out uh, in a way where everybody's at the table um, rather, than for, rather than at civil service. And that may be the plan all along, but I, I just, think we, we should talk about how we want to uh, construct that. No, no, I, I, I hear you and, and agree with you. I think the more we know from all ends, the better decision we can make. So certainly we will make ourselves available. Thank you so much. All right. I think that's the end of the presentations. Um, Mr. White, thank you again for your time. Uh, to my colleagues, here's my question for everybody. And, and Mr. Shai, I need you to correct me if I'm wrong. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, um, uh, six more um, ordinances relating to the budget itself. One motion that we need to pass to the financial audits. Do we want to go through the civil service uh, and other motions right now or wait till the council meeting? Uh, we also have a one o'clock GA meeting. Council Member Morrell, so I'm trying to be sensitive to people who may have back-to-back -back meetings, but I'll do what the group prefers. Council Member Green? Well, I, I actually have a question though, um, relative, sure. to the, relative to the one o'clock meeting, and I guess I'll learn this now, since we publicly advertise that that is going to be a meeting that is going to take place, and we know that we can't establish a quorum unless we 
would adjourn this meeting? What are our options? That's kind of an open question. Well, that's a good question. I think I think one o'clock is the stated time. And then of course, if there's a meeting that runs over, I don't think we've run a foul of anything because we've been continuously in one meeting. But let's check with Mr. Harang, who will tell me whether we need to stop or whether or not um, we, uh, we, we, we can press on with a little bit more business. Yeah, thanks, Council Member. We, uh, this happens um, semi-regularly. Um, we, a meeting will just push the start time. So um, it can't start before one o'clock, but if the previous meeting goes over, um, we generally start later uh, and that jives with, jives with the uh, open meetings law. So it's properly noticed, even if it starts late. Okay. Good question, Council Member Green. Thank you for that. Um, all right, colleagues. So what, what's your pleasure? As I said, I think we, we really probably need to pass number 14, which is authorizing selection of the audit firms. Um, the other matters can be taken up now in quick order. We can put them on the consent agenda for Thursday, or we can um, wait till Thursday to do it. So. This, I'm gonna Mr. Let Mr. Chairman, I, yes. I, it, it would appear from what was said, what Mr. Shah said previously, we have no comment on any of these items, and many of the members are already aware of them. And I think that for purposes of our next council meeting, which might be somewhat contentious, it might be worth taking up some of these items to put them on the consent agenda if they're not if they're not contentious. Just yep, that, that, that's perfect. Uh, I think that works out really well. All right. Well, I just want to, again, get the flavor and uh, work with everybody on this. So why don't we just do this? Why don't we go, Mr. Shai, we'll jump now to item number nine, which is an ordinance that's been held over relative to the capital budget. Um, who Who's going to be quickly explaining this from the administration? Kim DeLarge is on. on. Hey, Mr. DeLarge. How are you doing today? Um, yeah, so we, we, we briefed your staff earlier today. This is the uh, annual rollover ordinance where we roll over all of the capital funds that have been accumulated uh, in the capital program that you already voted on last year, or the council voted on last year in the capital budget ordinance. This rolls those over and it also takes off, uh, for instance, FEMA money um, that was over appropriated or we completed the project, we came in under budget. Um, it, so it also take and it also takes off any completed projects uh, funding. So in the, in the event, for an example, there's some old bond money that was on a completed project uh, that's coming off. In order for us to spend that money again, we would come back to the council and reappropriate that funds at a later date. So this is a annual rollover ordinance that rolls over the capital funds that allows us to continue the capital program. It doesn't uh, do anything but but that. All right, thank you, Mr. DeLarge. With that, I will move for approval. I'll second. Second by Council Member Morrell. Mr. Shai. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. Council Member Moreno. Yes. Council Member Morrell. Yes. Council Member Green. Yes. Council Member Thomas. All right, we'll count that as four yays. Four yays, yes. Thank you, Mr. Shai. All right, then we have a series of amendments to classified play plans, starting with item number 12. Is Mr. Hagman on the phone? Um, yes. All right, Good Mr. Afternoon. Hagman. Good afternoon. Um, the first item is hiring rates for the criminalist job series. That's for the police crime lab, as well as basically this is design in effect to recruit and retain present staff. The biggest problem is basically in retaining. So the intent of these hiring rates is basically to give that incentive to, to keep our criminals, you know, in the crime lab. The second part of this is a special rate of pay uh, for the people in the job classification in a police technician series. And this is designed because of the unique aspects of working in the NCIC section for people in that, you know, in those job classifications. So the intent of this is basically to be a, re, a retention uh, and recruitment tool for police. And the commission is uh, requesting the council's approval for these. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the committee members? 
Council Member Green, you want to make the motion on this? Yes, so moved. All right, and moved by Council Member Green, seconded by Council Member Morrell. Mr. Shai? Council Member Jeruso? Yay. Council Member Moreno? Council yes. Councilmember Morrell? Yes. Councilmember Green? Yes. Councilmember Thomas? Four yeas. The motion passes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hagman, number 11. The second item is a new job classification for the Council Utilities Regulatory Office. It would be the Curo Legislative Aid. Uh, recently, we created some uh, new job classifications for that department in order to build in out capacity. So this position basically would help continue along those lines to develop that capacity. That pay grade 77 has a hiring rate of 55,000 a year. And once again, the commission asked for the council's approval. I'll move. Moved by council member Morrell. Second Green. Second by council member Green, Mr. Shai. Council member Jeruso. Yay. Councilmember Moreno? Yes. Councilmember Morrell? Yes. Councilmember Green? Yes. Councilmember Thomas? Four yeas, the motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Shai. All right, Mr. Hagman, on to the next item. The third item is some additional changes relative to the $15 pay plan uh, amendments. These basically just essentially maintain a 5% differential between uh, their lower level counterparts. And at the Surge and Water Board, there were, because of the blending of different job series that flow into our utility meter series, we have a couple of classes that are a little bit adjusted more than 5%. Uh, and once again, the commission asked the council for their approval in this. Any questions from the committee? Hearing none, may. I entertain a motion. I'll move. Moved by Councilmember Morrell. Second Councilmember Green. Green seconded. Mr. Shai. Councilmember Jeruso. Yay. Councilmember Moreno. Yes. Councilmember Morrell. Yes. Councilmember Green. Yes. Councilmember Thomas. Four yeas. The motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Shai. All right, Mr. Hagman, I think that brings us to the last item for you, number 13. The last one is a special rate of pay. And this would this is basically, once again, a effort to uh, enhance the skill sets of our current in workforce. And it would provide for a 5% uh, special rate of pay for those people who uh, perform uh, inspections relative to public infrastructure and facilities. And for those individuals who, can, who, who obtained the certified public infrastructure inspector, they would receive a 5% uh, benefit over, over their normal pay when doing this type of work. And once again, the commission asked for the council's approval. Do I have a motion to approve? So move Green. Moved by Council Member Green. Second Morrell. Second by Council Member Morrell. Mr. Shai. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. Council Member Moreno? Yes. Council Member Morrell? Yes. Council Member Green? Yes. Council Member Thomas? Four yeas, no nays. The, the motion passes. Mr. Hagman, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. All right, the thank last, you. thank you. The last voting item today is a motion authorizing the selection of firms. Uh, Mr. Shai, do you wanna talk about this very quickly on the audit? Sir, uh, my Karen. So uh, this this motion authorizes two companies, Bruno and Turvalon, as well as Luther Spate and Company, to perform two tasks of our audit contract. We we've issued an audit RFP. Um, it actually has four subtasks to it. We've gotten we've, we haven't gotten full responses on all four of the tasks, but these companies are responsive and are able to perform the duties. We've had a selection review committee meeting where we've met and reviewed the qualifications of their proposals, and we are recommending via this motion that the council proceed with executing the contract. Um, we have a timeline to try to acquire and engage our auditors within 60 days of the closing of the year, which we are coming upon. And we also have a legislative auditor's timeline that we are trying to make sure we uphold. So we'll be issuing another RFP to um, 
to procure the rest of the remaining tasks, which will be the comprehensive annual financial report, the CAFR, as well as procuring the services of an auditor for the audit of the city employees retirement system. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll move to approve this. May I have a second? Second, Green. Second by Councilmember Green. Mr. Shah, will you please call the vote? Councilmember Jeruso? Yay. Councilmember Moreno? Yes. Councilmember Morrell? Yes. Councilmember Green? Yes. Councilmember Thomas? Four yeas, no nays. The, the motion passes. Thank you. Before we end, Mr. Shai, as housekeeping, I would ask that all matters uh, were voted on unanimously today, with the exception of items seven and eight, which Councilmember Moreno may need to amend, that everything else be placed on the consent agenda, please. And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Move by Council Member Moreno, second by, I'm sorry, Morrell, second by Moreno. I'm going to keep on making that mistake, y'all. Um, Mr. Shai, any, I might do this way. Anybody object to, to uh, ending this meeting? I take that as four yeas. We stand adjourned. Thank you to everybody for all your hard work today. Thank you.